Good afternoon and welcome to the board's business meeting on this day, Tuesday, December the 3rd, 2019. If we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If I can... Get approval to um, a motion to approve the revised agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. We come to the human resources and development portion of our agenda. Dr. Smith? Yes, thank you, Ms. Evans. We have a um, human resources and development report, monthly report in front of the board for your consideration. That's a monthly report. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? And that is unanimous. We also want to pause today and uh, remember some staff members who have passed away. Um, first of all, the death on October 12, 2019 of Mr. Timothy Wright, Carpentry Area Assistant Supervisor, Bethesda Maintenance Depot, saddened the staff, students, and members of the Board of Education. During the 7.7 .7 years Mr. Wright worked for Montgomery County Public Schools, he demonstrated a steadfast commitment to students by maintaining the safety, security, and utility of our public schools. Mr. Wright was recognized by his supervisors and crew members as a courteous and professional employee who was highly respected for his knowledge and skills as a carpenter and technician. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools express their sorrow at the death of Mr. Wright and extend deepest sympathies to his family. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. We also want to pause today and remember uh, Ms. Nakisha S. Rowland. Her death on October 25, 2019 um, saddened the staff, students, and members of the Board of Education. Ms. Rowland was a math teacher at Briggs Cheney Middle School. During her 8.2 years, that Ms. Rowland worked for Montgomery County Public Schools, she consistently strived to create and maintain a classroom environment in which students felt respected and supported. Ms. Rowland was committed to the success of all students and tirelessly worked with her colleagues to implement strategies for improvement to support the Montgomery County Public Schools mission. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools express their sorrow at the death of Ms. Rowland and extend deepest sympathy to her family. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, at this time, the next item on our agenda is public comments. Public comments is one of the opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, program, and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. This is a public meeting, and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper etiquette. Inappropriate personal remarks, rude retorts, or other such behavior is out of order and will not be tolerated. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, and work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. Each speaker will receive three minutes for comments. Please speak clearly into the, and directly into the microphone. 30 seconds prior to the expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on, accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signals that your time has expired. Please push the button on the microphone to begin speaking and push it once more at the sound of the buzzer. We are asking speakers to be respectful to all who have signed up to testify by adhering to the time limits and stopping your testimony when the buzzer sounds. If possible, we ask that you remain in the room in case board members have comments to make or questions to ask. If you have not done so already, please make certain that staff has a copy of your testimony before sitting down. At this time, we call to the table Cindy Lotto, Kassan Whitney, Yana Lee, Felician, Rose Marie, Marcel.
and we can um, begin with Miss Lotto. Hello? Mm -hmm. There we go. I'd like to thank the Board of Education for their time. My name is Cindy Lotto. I'm an MCA board member, and I'm speaking today as a voice of high school educators specifically regarding the county's position and potential intended alterations to the secondary grading and reporting. You'll be receiving an update later in the day on the work that's been produced by the Grading and Reporting Committee on templates. The county's goal to make course-alike grading templates common across the county is understood by educators. We get that. We truly appreciate the committee's willingness to incorporate educator perspective on this topic. However, it's the future actions of the Grading and Reporting Committee and this board that we, high school educators that is, want to speak to. Specifically, we want to express the continued desire to ensure that educator autonomy be a priority as this committee moves forward. The committee goal of identifying quantities of assignments per category is the area of discomfort. Dictation of the number of assignments given, their value, and the time frame to be administered will be the death of public education. Students' needs will not be met. Social emotional responsiveness will not be prioritized. Real life application will be simply impossible. Educator creativity will be stifled and the public part of public education will seem like a faux title. On behalf of educators, I beg that as we move forward, meeting the needs of our diverse populations, that we consider equity, not solely equality. We, of course, do believe in high standards for all our students. Educators are fully capable of reading and analyzing curriculum objectives, though. If they provide daily assignments to ensure student work completion and effort in a setting where students respond best to immediate and regular feedback and chunking of material, then let them do so. If they provide a weekly assignment, which pulls upon multiple skills and measures several objectives, let them do so. Teachers alter instruction and grading based on many factors, from attendance to reading level, the ESOL status of their classroom to extended time needs. Quality differentiated instruction comes in varying forms. We truly, truly believe our existing committee will work to ensure that educator autonomy and student needs are recognized and valued. Promises of flexibility and ranges have already occurred. We ask that you, as a board, support us as educators in ensuring that our professionalism remains intact by keeping our job professional. Lastly, we would like to remind our Board of Education members that while final exams have been identified as a topic of non-discussion for this committee, it is a topic of desired discussion amongst secondary educators. With the freedom to teach and grade as we have been educated and certified to do, we would gladly take on the measurement of these larger object objectives via final exams. Thank okay. you. At this time, we will hear from Kassan Whitney. Dear MCPS board members, in American culture and society, we celebrate many holidays, often from heroes who have changed our country, such as Martin Luther King Day or Veterans Day. One holiday that is blatantly celebrated without much context is Columbus Day. This day is not celebrating the discovery of America as it is often portrayed as. It is honoring the cruel and unjust killing of millions of indigenous people, more specifically the Tainos group in the Caribbean. Columbus Day is celebrated as the discovery of America and has been forced into the minds of many Americans as, as that, but it is not true. Christopher Columbus left Spain August 3rd in search of India and finding an easier route to their riches. But he put his anchors down in the waters of the Caribbean. The first people he met, he called, he called Indians, believing he was in India, but he was really talking to Tainos peop native people. Yes, the Tainos. How many people really know that name? The people who barely have a trace left in our country or the entire world, in, in fact. Christopher Columbus and his men killed millions and practically destroyed a whole race of people. We shouldn't honor the mass genocide that Columbus brought to the, to the Tainos. MCC, MCPS should replace Columbus Day with the Indigenous Peoples Day. The Tainos should be honored along with the millions of other people and native groups that Europeans, along with settlers, killed by changing Columbus Day to a day for indigenous peoples, specifically the Tainos. We're informing people in MCPS of the history you most don't know about. As of right now, the MCPS calendar contains an American Indian Heritage Day, which falls on Black Friday. This is not enough because this day we don't have school or to honor our indigenous people, but also is a day that is covered by shopping and great rampage to get the best deals. 
Our curriculum has been tainted with this view of Columbus making the great discovery of America, when in reality he was the source of a mass genocide of a now almost extinct group of peoples. We have given acknowledgement to the murder to the murder of these people for too long, and it's time to shed light on the people who thrived here once before. Thank you. If you're a student, if you don't mind, just tell me what school you're from, if you're speaking. So what school or high school are you from? I'm from Kennedy High School. Okay, thank you. So um, now we will hear from Yana Lee Felician. Okay. <coughs> All right. My name is Lee Felician, and I'm from John Kennedy High School. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. When I was in an MCPS elementary school, this poem expert was what I learned about the beginning of America. It was a story of about a person from the lower class that rose up and managed to travel against, across the sea and discovered a new world. However, I was lucky that I had a friend of the Native American people. She was the first person to tell me how the story actually went. She's the reason why today I'm able to write this letter. I'm able to stand, uh, sit here today to explain the problem with the lies told about Christopher Columbus and what needs to be done about them. In 1492, Columbus did sail the ocean blue. However, he landed in modern day Bahamas. He was met face to face with the natives of the Taino people. If this was a story told in classes, Columbus would be portrayed as a traitor, a giver of gifts. The story would end there. But that's not the truth. Columbus and his men came vaguely friendly, but within the next expedition, they enslaved, massacred, and subjugated the Tayana people. They tried to defend themselves or escape in any way that they could. But over the next 20 years, they had stolen their land or been driven into hiding, with Columbus awarded for his inhumanity. To this day, the U.S. celebrates, mostly unknowingly, the enslavement and use of the Tayano people. As a school system, it's the duty of everyone involved to spread truth and education, helping people gain a full understanding of the world around them so that they can make their own decisions as they become a part of the world is one of the most important things of parts of education. And yet people are still being told that someone that explored nowhere near the United States, enforced deadly slavery, and stole land from its people is a hero of the American story. In this country, we have a bad habit of celebrating slavery and massacres. This habit is one that we're moving away from, but in order to take more steps in the future, a fundamental change and a fundamental understanding must change. That's why you're here. That's why we've got her here. A grave injustice is being committed every year. Cl Christopher Columbus is still being commemorated. It's every year, MCPS congratulates the many accomplishments of Columbus. At some point in history, the U.S. did believe that Columbus discovered the U.S., traded with people, and brought about the America that we know today. But we know that's not true. We've known it for a long time. It's a myth in its entirety. So we no longer have an excuse, and that's for the better. As a county of intelligent, growing minds, of leaders and believers in a better world, we have no excuse to celebrate Columbus to this day. We have no excuse to celebrate the atrocities that he committed. As such, Columbus Day should be removed from the MCPS calendar. Let's stop celebrating the crimes. Can I finish? Finish your last sentence. Okay. Let's stop <laughs> celebrating the crimes against humanity that was committed against the Tayana people and get to work so commemorating the Native Americans. If that holiday was made to celebrate the beginning of America, let's do it properly. There is still hope to be had here. So let's start from the beginning. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. These words don't mean the same thing for every person, but let's at, le at least make sure that they're true. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now we will hear from Rosemarie Marcel. I'm Rosemarie Marcel, and I go to John F. Kennedy High School. And I'm Gabriella. We co-read a story about the true story of Columbus, but in the form of a children's book. Okay. Speak up a little bit. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. What did he do? I'll give you a clue. It was not good. Columbus crossed the Atlantic with his 17 ships. On his voyage to India, it was quite the trip. But the destination reached was not as promised, and instead of Asia, he ended up in the Bahamas. When they arrived, they would find a kind native tribe. They were giving and naive, as Columbus would describe. The natives were not ready for the following traumas, because if they knew what was coming, they would have run for their mamas. 
Columbus's intentions were far from good. He manipulated the natives in every way he could. His journal accounts this. It's very true that him and his men were very cruel. In his entry, he states that the natives brought them parrots, balls of cotton, and spears too. They willingly traded everything they knew. They did not bear arms, didn't even know what they were, for when he showed them a sword, they weren't the slightest bit perturbed. In fact, they took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. Oh, how unusual was their pureness and innocence. They would make fine servants, Columbus admits. With only 50 men, they could make the natives do whatever they insist. Like lead, like lead them to the gold hidden throughout the land for the sake of keeping their very hands. His only purpose was to seize wealth in order to enrich both his sponsors and himself. Later in life, Columbus would say, he who possesses gold has all he needs in the world today. He thought that under Christian faith, the natives would be better freed from error, but his main method of conversion was invoking fear and terror. The native girls were treated like toys and forced to play with Columbus's boys. They had to do whatever the boys wanted and do it gladly. It hurt their feelings very badly. A close friend of his once admitted that such inhumanities were committed in his sight, so foreign to human nature that, the, that he trembles as he writes. The Native Americans were so overworked and taken for granted that their tribe was wiped out before one could blink, and by 1650 they would all be extinct. Columbus committed n numerous atrocities. What he did was a monstrosity. Yet every year he is honored for a day. Don't the indigenous people deserve a say? Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, we will, um, do we have any more students speaking? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so what is your name? Tell me your name. Okay, so we'll go a little bit out of order. McClee, go ahead and speak. In 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Well, that is what we are told. We recite as kids the tale of a man who landed in the Bahamas. We are told that the indigenous people peacefully gave away their land, along with their culture. Indigenous people are silenced as they are kept quiet. Their stories aren't being listened to. People say Columbus should be celebrated. Columbus Day is an American tradition. It may be seemingly difficult to let go of such a holiday, but the indigenous men and women who have been denied of a say deserve more. It is our job to give them a voice, to speak for the indigenous Taino women that were raped, the people that labored under Columbus's rule. It is our job to represent the diverse student population of Montgomery County and get rid of a day that represents the grip of white supremacy in the United States. It is our job to give voice to the voiceless. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Nate, Mr. Tinbite. So before you all get up, I wanted to say thank you for coming today. And I know that we have class today for sure. So thank you. Um, you guys are definitely representing our school well. Yeah. 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 Oh. Before you leave, could you also um, tell us who um, is your social studies teacher? We, yes. the three of us, are students. Turn your light. Turn your light on. Um, the three of us are students of Mr. Williams, Michael Williams, and John F. Kennedy. And, okay. And me and Kasalan are students from Miss Sinkhole. Miss Nala Sinkhole. And, and everyone is from John F. Kennedy. Yes. Okay. Very good. So, Dr. Daka, you had a light on. Yeah, I was going to remind uh, them to tell us that it was John F. Kennedy, and um, I, there was not one name we did not get. Uh, we had we got McClee, yeah. and who's the other? You know, your name we didn't get, but anyhow, we saw all of you when we were at Kennedy last week. We really appreciate you coming and taking your time to do this um, in front of all these people and on TV, so right. we appreciate it, and the um, honesty of what you're saying is really important to us. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Smith, could we have um, the curriculum department just kind of go back and give us more historical context? We have our students here speaking about removing Columbus um, Day from the calendar, our printed materials, as well as renaming it Indigenous People Day. Could we just go back and kind of get some, take a look at what other districts are doing as well around that? Absolutely. We can give the board a brief on the holiday itself and the history of that holiday as well as the current thinking across school systems around this very important topic. Mm -hmm. I just want to thank you as students, uh, you know, as a, a teacher of many students across different countries and different states, I am always impressed when MCPS students speak so eloquently about such complex and serious and important topics. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Mr. Yeah. Vestry, I see your light on as well. 
Um, no, I also wanted to thank you for your testimony as someone of Maya heritage. Uh, I appreciate you bringing this up to us and looking forward to the recommendations to see what um, can be done. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to thank Ms. Lotto for being here and look forward to the discussion later um, on this topic. Mrs. O'Neill. Yes, um, I just wanted to point out that we do not typically close on Columbus Day or Correct. Indigenous People Day. It's but it is listed in our days of commemoration mm -hmm. and so I mean I think that is the where you know we should make the change but you know it's our parent it is our parent visitation day um, and particularly in the elementary schools mm -hmm. we usually have a large crowd so you know I, I do think we should take a look at our mm -hmm. curriculum mm -hmm. for sure Absolutely. Okay. thank you so at this time, we will thank everyone for coming out today to get public comments, and we always appreciate hearing from our students as well as our, our teachers um, in our system. So at this time, we will ask you to, um, to leave the table, and we will invite, <laughs> and we will, in, as politely as I can ask, and we will ask our next group to come to the table. That would be Syed Ali, Ali Jennifer Stein, Byron Johns, and Elisa Andrade. Andriad, if I pronounce that correctly. Okay, so we will start with Mr. Ali. Good morning, members of Montgomery County Board of Education. My name is Sayyad Ali. In the next three minutes, I, will, uh, I would like to cover a couple of topics. First one is the request regarding the ongoing boundary assessment. We all know that multiple schools in MCPS system are using portable classrooms. As part of the ongoing assessment, can we collect the utilization data for individual schools in the format where capacity and utilization are calculated with and without portables? Uh, if you have my testimony, you will see there was a, t a screenshot there. It is, taken from, it is an example taken from the Wake County Public School System, North Carolina. If you look closely, the additional information here is that trailers or portables are also taken into consideration when analyzing the utilization number. That's a very important information because so many of our schools, elementary, middle school, high schools are using the portables. This will certainly help the board in making more informed decision when it comes to boundary changes, revitalization projects, and for allocating other budgetary needs. The next topic that I would like to cover is school calendar for the year 2020-2021. Last night at the dinner table, I asked my seven-year-old daughter Aisha, if given a chance, how she will convince the board for Eid holiday. Her answer brings forth a very interesting perspective. Here is what she said. I'm just paraphrasing what she said. Mm -hmm. I will request the board members to mark Eid as holiday in the school calendar for the sake of my non-Muslim friends. Being a Muslim, I'm sure even if it's not officially marked as holiday, I will stay home to celebrate it with my family. But dear board members, I want to invite my Jewish, Christian, and Hindu friends also to celebrate and share my joy with them. And that can only happen if you declare Eid as holiday. If it's not a holiday, I don't think that I can convince the parents of those kids to take a day off. I was pleasantly surprised with her reasoning, and, and at that point I was making points for this, this testimony and then I gave up that, all my discussion and then I thought I will just say what she said. And I completely agree with her as sharing is indeed a core value when it comes to Eid al-Fitr. MCPS has always been at the forefront in bringing positive changes in the system and I'm very optimistic that today will, be, will not be any different. I'm again requesting with my folded hands to declare 30th, 30th May 2021 as either a day off or a professional day. Thank you and may the peace be upon all of you. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Ms. Stein. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Stein, School Safety Lead for Moms Demand Actions, Maryland Chapter. We're here today to inform the board about a recent report on school safety co-authored by Everytown for Gun Safety, National Education Association, and American Federation of Teachers. The report sets forth data on gun violence on school campuses and provides recommendations for narrowly tailored solutions to the problem of gun violence in schools. This report can help guide the board to take more specific action on this important issue and is attached to my written testimony. 
Almost seven years ago, 20 young children and six staff members were gunned down at Sandy Hook Elementary School. It is this hor horrific mass shooting that led to the formation of Moms Demand Action in December 2012. Since Sandy Hook, we've grown into a true grassroots movement with six million supporters and chapters in every state. But since Sandy Hook, there have also been more than 260 incidents of gunfire on school grounds. Another horrific shooting took place just last month at a high school in Santa Clarita, California, that left three students dead and three more injured. This student was a current student who brought a gun to school that he accessed from home. The data shows that school shooters are most often current or former <coughs> students, and their firearms most often come from their own home or homes in the community. Shooters almost always show concerning warning signs before the shooting or tell their plans to other people, most often their peers. Based on the report, we are working with other interested groups on a resolution that will help prevent gun violence in schools. The Los Angeles Unified School District recently took action along the lines of what we propose here, requiring that information on secure storage be sent to the families of 700,000 students in that school system and requiring a signature acknowledging awareness of safe gun storage responsibilities. We think such a, res a resolution should include among other provisions, requiring notification to parents about the importance of secure gun storage and their obligation under Maryland state law to prevent minors from accessing guns and requiring a signature acknowledging receipt of this information, requiring instructions to students in how and when to use existing tip lines in situations involving firearms, ensuring that all Administrators and staff are made aware of Maryland's extreme risk protective order law, which can temporarily remove access to firearms from students at risk to themselves or others. And Thank ensuring you. the proper We have your testimony. We have your written testimony. Your time has expired. Thank you so much. Thank you. At this time, we will hear from Mr. Johns. And we're presenting that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good. Uh, well, good. Good afternoon, uh, board. Um, my name is Byron Johns on behalf of the NAACP, Montgomery County Parents Council and the Black and Brown Coalition for Educational Equity and Excellence. I want to provide unqualified support for the board's seven to one decision to affirm Superintendent Smith's recommendation for the boundary changes to Seneca Valley, Northwest and Clarksburg clusters. We thank Superintendent Jack Smith and the board members that demonstrated their commitment to equity courageously voted for a fair and equitable outcome in the face of vile and sometimes intimidating letters and online comments, and who publicly spoke out against such uncivil acts. We applaud such acts of leadership. In contrast to critical and factually incorrect statements made by some community members, the boundary study process, regarding the boundary study process, we commend the staff and the board for their inclusiveness, transparency, and open communications shown throughout the past 12-month process. Communities of color, which typically have been overlooked or underrepresented, are appreciative of the opportunity to have their voices heard and considered alongside communities who are more familiar with and more conversant in asserting their perspectives. We have confidence that the solution chosen resulted from careful analysis by the superintendent and was approved after due diligence by the majority of the Board of Ed because it benefits the most students, balances competing objectives, and on balance best serves the district's mission, values, and priorities. As with any school boundary change, some people are resistant to change, often fueled by fear, parochial interests, anxiety over the unknown, and misinformation. We understand, and together, we will replace those fears with outreach, healing, and forging new friendships. At the same time, we strongly reject and rebuke the bitter, racist, toxic, and hateful vitriol 
being spewed by a few community members. We admonish all such behaviors and speech and do not believe it reflects our broader community's values. There is no justification or tolerance for debasing and devaluing any of our diverse communities students anywhere, but especially in Montgomery County. Please resist perpetuating these negative mindsets to your children, as the long-term effects can create a noxious social and learning environment which serves no one's interest. We implore all three high school cluster communities to work side by side with us to champion equi educational equity and excellence for the betterment of all students. Thank I invite you. you to join the NAACP and the Parents Council as we work to Thank make you. MCAPS a model. We have your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Johns. At this time, we'll hear from... At, at this time, we will hear from Ms. Andrade. Good afternoon, Dr. Smith and Board of Education. My name is Elisa Andrade, and I speak before you today in my capacity as a consulting teacher for the Department of Professional Growth Systems. I have been an educator for 14 years, and for 11 of those years, proudly serving the students of MCPS. My purpose today is to share with you firsthand the importance of our consulting teacher team within the peer assistance and review program and the significance of ensuring all of the teachers standing in front of our children are quality teachers who are committed to all of our students. Additionally, my purpose is to explain the importance of ensuring our consulting teacher team is adequately staffed for the 2020-2021 school year. The job of the consulting teacher is two-tiered. We support both new teachers to our profession and those teachers who hold tenure in our county but are struggling to meet our teaching standards. We provide our teachers with feedback on through observations that are specifically geared toward their needs. We plan lessons with our teachers to ensure differentiation for our students. We take our teachers on peer visits and we provide our teachers with resources among very other various supports. But how do the aforementioned supports impact our children? <laughs> When we observe teachers' implicit bias and calling patterns and have a conversation with them that breaks down racial barriers, it impacts our children. When we support a teacher in elevating the English language learner supports in our benchmark reading program, it directly impacts our children. When we developed a tiered behavior system with one of our teachers for a student who is struggling to maintain their attention to task, it has a direct impact on our children. 20 years ago when our PAR program began, our program was designed to have consulting teachers support about 16 teachers on our caseloads. In 2008, our consulting teacher team supported 471 teachers with 32 consulting teachers. Currently, we have a team of 29 supporting 613 teachers currently and giving us an average caseload of 21 teachers or more. This means we're supporting over 142 more teachers with much fewer consulting teachers on our team. Our increased number of new teachers, including conditionally certified teachers, speaks volumes about the need to fully fund our program. Furthermore, due to a nationwide teacher shortage that we are feeling in Montgomery County, we are supporting teachers who are conditionally certified or hold provisional certificates who typically need higher frequency and intensity of support than that of our typical College of Education graduate. I'm respectfully ask, asking the board to consider that the, that the work of our consulting teacher team does in supporting our teachers, thereby impacting our students in the classroom. I am asking you to consider funding four more consulting teachers for the 2020-2021 school year. I look forward to continuing the work for one of our leading school districts in the country who's committed to our teacher growth, thereby ensuring the su success of all of our children. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And sorry for mis mispronouncing your name. My apologies. Thank you. Um, Mrs. O'Neill. Yes, Ms. Rowley, I just wanted to point out that the superintendent's recommended calendar includes a professional day on May 13th, 2020, that coincides with the. Okay. Ms. Sebestre. Um, and Lunar New Year on. Can I don't know the date. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dr. Smith, why, uh, Mr. Ali's comment about portables, why don't we include portables in our capacity? We don't Studies. include portables in our uh, standard capacity measure for a school because they are 
supposed to be temporary. Given the more than 10 years of growth of Montgomery County Public Schools, they are not temporary. We have reduced the number of portables significantly, though, in the last two decades from its all-time high. And so we'll take a look at the testimony today and what's been offered and look at how we can report that out to our community in a way that will make sense and will factor in everything that, uh, that uh, is part of a school site and facility. Thank you. Dr. Daka. I just wanted to thank Mr. Johns for coming out to talk about how we need to work together to make sure that this boundary uh, program is going to be great for all students. We really appreciate that. And uh, we, we thank you also for coming to talk uh, with us. Um, yeah, my brain's gone, but thank you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So seeing no more lights, I just want to thank all of our um, panelists for coming to talk today to get public comments. Dr. Smith, did you want to make a comment? I was just going to say, say we accepted the letter and we will make sure that it is uh, copied or transcribed and provide a copy to each board member. Yes. So thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. Thank You're you. fine. Okay. So at this time, we just want to thank you all again and we'll call to the table our next um, panel of speakers. And please, um, charge to my head, not my heart, for mispronouncing your name if I do that. Um, Chi Zhang, Eliza Hong, Christopher Klein, and Ravon Johnson. I'll have you speak in the order that I called you. We'll start with Mr. Zhang. Yes. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a father of two kids in Montgomery County Public School. We are very disappointed on BOE's November 26 decision to bus Germantown students to Clarksburg schools and Clarksburg students to Germantown schools. This is a decision against the will of 82% of the survey respondents from Clarksburg. The decision ignored the students' top priority to learn and get educated. We want to let all the board B BOE members know that we do not agree on you putting demographic over all other factors. Narrow focus on demographic alone straight away from school's core function as an education facility. Busing students across neighborhoods will make their already packed schedule even more challenging. The additional hours of bus commute does not add much value to the students and their family. Instead, busing students across neighborhoods will waste their valuable time and already very tight BOE budget. In yesterday's town hall meeting at Kennedy High, several students asked about NCPS mental health support. We can foresee BOE's uh, November 26 decision will create more stress and anxiety in students. It is an unwise decision that will create more long-term problems. We also want to remind you the existing traffic conditions of Montgomery County. Many parents spend more than one extra hour a day getting stuck in the uh, congested traffic. BOE's unfounded ideal will turn Montgomery County into a huge parking lot in the future. The deteriorated traffic will stress not only the students, but also their parents. When communicating with our community members, we have a common feeling that our voices were not heard, even though some of the BOE members claim they did. Let us make it clear that our priority is not only what you heard, but also what you did. I also want to take this opportunity to remind all public officers that you were elected to uh, serve the people, not to rule them. People who forget about this very important principle will be voted out of their position with embarrassment. We, of course, don't want that to happen to too many of our VOE members. Geographic proximity is our major concern. Please hear us and act accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. So now we will hear from Ms. Hong.
Good afternoon, esteemed members of the Board of Education. Thank you for this opportunity to come and speak before you. I am a former Springbrook High School graduate, elementary school teacher, current consulting teacher, and a future parent of an MCPS student. I come before the board to talk about one of the most unique and impactful aspects of our school system, the peer assistance and review program and the consulting teacher team. We have the privilege of supporting novice and underperforming teachers in our school system with the sole focus of building their knowledge base, honing their teaching skills, and ultimately having a direct impact on student achievement. We impact every school at every level and indirectly every student. I'd like to take a moment to provide a quick glimpse of the unique and effective teacher supports that we offer. We provide feedback through formal and informal observations and reports. We provide immediate and specific feedback in real time that teachers can use. For example, when we visit a teacher's classroom, we send standards-based feedback with specific instructional resources tailored to the teacher's evolving needs and collaborate with teachers to develop and meet short and long-range progressive goals. Teachers then have an opportunity to reflect on that feedback and implement changes to improve their teaching craft. We provide resources in areas such as planning, behavior management, equity, and assessment. We are in our teachers' classrooms coaching, co-teaching, analyzing data trends, and instruct instructional practices to think about how to best meet the needs of our students. We work with school administration. We connect our teachers to human resources, such as setting up in-school supports with other staff members like reading specialists, staff development teachers, and content specialists. We also connect teachers with out-of-school supports by setting up peer visits. Because of how closely we work with our teachers, we are also able to recognize the professional development needs that our teachers face and consequ consequently play a very important role in the creation and execution of effective professional development within our school system. Here are three recent examples. This past summer, the consulting teacher team recognized a need based on our experiences with our teachers to update the portion of NEO, now called Creating Conditions for Success, to include a more pronounced focus on equity. Our team also recognized pervasive foundational teaching gaps, primarily among conditionally certified teachers, and from there designed a professional development course called Planning for Meaningful Instruction. The final example is how our team identified the professional development needs of the first year Title I teachers and created a course in conjunction with the Title I office. The consulting teacher team strives daily to grow the capacity of our teaching force by supporting them to become more effective in our classroom. As my colleague Elisa Andrade shared, our team is facing some challenges as the numbers of new teachers and conditionally certified teachers rise. In order to do our work with integrity, we are asking that the board invest in all our children by investing in four more consulting teacher positions in the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you for your continued support and faith in our program, and we look forward to working together. Thank, Thank you. you. So now we will hear from Mr. Klein. Thank you. I want to begin by thanking Dr. Smith and the Board of Education for hearing my testimony today. Like my colleagues before me, I'm here with MCA support to speak on behalf of consulting teachers in Montgomery County. In the remarks I've submitted in advance, I've supported my claims with research and cited my sources. That's my English teacher side, and I just can't help it. Uh, teaching is a complex and demanding profession that takes time and experience to reach optimal capacity. At the same time, students only get one chance to complete a grade level. Given that the continuous need to recruit, develop, and retain high quality educators is in tension with the high stakes of student need, it is incumbent on educational systems and educators to commit to a process of continuing improvement. As a result, all schools around the world adopt models for professional development and performance evaluation, though not all put student outcomes first by bringing these two strands together. Some systems rely only on overworked administrators, while others ask teachers to spend countless hours creating portfolios justifying their work, time that can be better spent on students, but not MCPS. We lead the way by putting our students first. MCPS has shown an inspiring commitment to bring together evaluation and professional development under the Peer Assistance and Review Program, and I'm here today to make sure that we do not take for granted the innovative system that has made us one of the best school systems in the United States. Students deserve the richest possible learning environments, which means that they deserve the best possible teachers. But great teaching is learned and not innate. Since research tells us that learning outcomes are maximized when feedback is timely, criteria for success are clearly defined, and performance is accurately and robustly tied to those criteria, it is essential for education systems to adopt models that provide those things for our teachers so that they can in turn provide those things for our, our students. This is what consulting teachers do every single day, and I'm speaking now to ensure that our important work is visible to the Board of Education so that when the time comes to make difficult budget budgetary decisions, 
we don't take for granted one of the most critical elements of our great system. Finally, I'm proud to say that I am a consulting teacher myself, but I'm equally proud to call myself an MCPS parent. I'm the father of two young boys. My eldest attends kindergarten at Forest Knowles Elementary School and has a first year teacher. And I feel great about that, but even more confident knowing that his teacher has a consulting teacher to support her as she grows in the craft. I end with this, because every student deserves an expert teacher Please continue to fully fund the consulting teachers and peer assistance and review program. Thank you. Thank you. And so our next speaker is not Ravon Johnson, if you will introduce <laughs> yourself. Uh, thank you. I'm a substitute. I'm Lisa Murdoch. Uh, good afternoon, uh, President Evans, uh, board members and staff, and Dr. Smith. <laughs> I'm Lisa Murdoch. I'm the NAACP Parent Council Representative for Seneca Valley High School. I just wanted to thank the board members for their recent decision in the Seneca Valley Boundary Study. I know it was very contentious. The considerations and concessions made in the recent decision were a new beginning for our community and our new school. We look forward to the bright future that will be provided for students and the many new programs that will be available at Seneca Valley High School. We already are an international baccalaureate world school. However, at the new school with its new capacity, we'll have more AP and additional IB classes offered. The new school will expand an already extensive career education program as Seneca will lead the way with new pathways in CTE education. Although some may not be familiar with Ger the Germantown community, it has a welcoming and forgiving nature. The vibrant community is shocked that there is still so much disdain for Seneca Valley and its students from those who claim to represent Clarksburg. I want to ask those Clarksburg leaders to remember that remarks that are racist and demeaning in nature have no place in our county. We are not against you, and I appeal to your humanity to refrain from treating innocent students in a disrespectful manner. Your words are hurtful. I think it is important that the board and all of MCPS work together to make Seneca Valley a huge success. I believe the successful transition in the fall of 2020 will mute most of the concerns in the community. I do hope, though, that the Montgomery County Council and the Maryland DOT will be innovative in their pursuit of transportation solutions for the entire upcounty region, perhaps utilizing 21st century ideas the monorails being proposed, other rail options, reversible lanes on 355, dedicated bike lanes, etc. The transportation piece is a collaborative one that will not be solved by MCPS, but by the greater community. We want to welcome all of the new students and families that will come to our school. We value your culture and perspective. Please feel free to attend our PTSA meetings, our NAACP Parent Council meetings, <coughs> join our events. We have an international night coming up. Let me reiterate, I think you will be pleasantly surprised. Come out in friendship and you will be greeted in kind. Thank you for your time and cooperation. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Wolf. Um, I wanted to thank all of you for your comments especially Ms. Murdoch, thank you. But I also wanted to make the point that um, I make my decisions based on the facts that I've been given. And I don't make any decision based on whether I'm reelected. Because if I'm not, I'm not. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Um, so I too would just like to thank everybody for coming um, to speak today. We appreciate the time, especially our teachers who work very hard in our system, in particular there are parents as well. So Ms. Murdoch, thank you. Um, thank Ms. Ms. Johnson um, for her advocacy. And at this time we will hear um, from our next panelists. I will call them up. Bernadette Champagne, Norel, uh, Nora Morales, and Yoisi Quintero. So we will go in the order that I called your name. We will start off with Miss um, Champagne. Yeah. 
Good morning. That's okay. Turn your light on. Push the button. Yes. All right. Good afternoon, Board of Education and uh, Superintendent Dr. Smith. Hello. I'm a parent of two MCPS students, a concerned resident of Montgomery County, and a member of the Black and Brown Coalition for Educational Equity. I have resided in the county for two years, and my children have the fortune to live in the Wooten High School cluster. Their positive experiences have shown me the importance of having well-resourced schools, strong leaders, and effective teachers to ensure their success. I'm grateful that Superintendent Dr. Smith and the board have taken the initiative to address in inequity in our schools and to have a balanced composition of the schools based on socioeconomic status, geography, and demographics. I understand that this boundary analysis and, cha um, sorry, and changes are incredibly important as they determine each student's academic path. I support the superintendent's recommendation for option 11A for the changes to the boundaries of the Seneca Valley, Clarksburg, and New Northwest Cluster. Why I am glad that there was a majority of you who voted for the most common sense choice for all the cho from all the choices, I am concerned that not everyone is on the same page as far as the future of education in our county. I applaud the efforts that you are taking and want to uplift the voices of those parents who are not able to be here today. These are the parents that are often disenfranchised and marginalized and are not included in the conversation. These parents see the importance of taking into account walking distance, the facilities available for usage, and the distribution of students with high financial need who participate in the farms program because oftentimes they are the ones affected by changes. I encourage the superintendent, Dr. Smith, and the Board of Education to fulfill the Montgomery County promise and ensure that all students, regardless of their background or school of attendance, have the necessary resources to thrive academically, socially, and emotionally. Thank you for your continuous work and for naming and working to address equity in all forms and levels, including where our children are assigned to attend. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will hear from Nada Morales. Hi, I'm presenting on behalf of Diego Uriburu, so pretend I'm in Argentine. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Dr. Smith, members of the Board of Education and Executive Le Leadership. I'm Diego Uriburu, the Executive Director of Identity and member of the Black and Brown Coalition for Educational Equity. I come before you today in full support of the Superintendent's and Board's 11A boundary recommendation for the Clarksburg, Northwest, and Seneca Valley Cluster. We offer our kudos to those who are courageous enough to put children before politics and to ensure an equitable system where all students succeed. Research is clear. When we give students the resources, supports, and instructional talent that they need, they thrive beyond our expectations. The superintendents and boards recommendation to promote systemic equity through the balanced composition of schools, uh, building capacity, programming, and geography is a brave step towards remedying institutional barriers that leave out our highest need students and staff without the supports they need to succeed. In addition to this recommendation, we encourage Dr. Smith and board members to think proactively about the strategies needed to implement these changes and adequately support all students regardless of which school they attend. Why does it seem to be so difficult to do what is right for all students? Isn't it common sense for everyone to embrace these boundary changes, changes that provide a real opportunity to reduce overcrowding in our schools and therefore reduce class size, an opportunity for students to come together from various backgrounds in a global village for learning and collaboration, and an opportunity to open access to great programming for all students instead of just a few? It is difficult because a few vocal minorities see these changes as a zero-sum game where opening access and improving conditions for some students equates to a threat. Shame on those who wish to curtail progress on the backs of our most vulnerable and yet promising students. 
The Black and Brown Coalition will continue to support the superintendent and the Board of Education in their pursuit of a more equitable system as they courageously embark on this arduous work of dismantling decades of systemic bias and barriers for vulnerable students. As a county and district, we must embrace and support every one of our students. The Black and Brown Coalition looks forward to working with those who wish to provide a world-class education for all. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will hear from Yoisi Quintero. Okay. Yeah. Buenos días, señores de la Junta de Educación del Condado de Montgomery. Mi nombre es Yoisi Quintero, soy mamá de un estudiante en Nearsville Middle School y miembro de la Coalición Afroamericana y Latina por la Equidad Educacional. Quiero agradecer a la Junta Educativa su decisión inquebrantable de ofrecer verdaderas y equilibradas oportunidades de evolución académica a todos los niños del condado, sin distingo de raza, nacionalidad o ingreso económico familiar. Agradezco también ese empeño en abrir caminos a la multiculturalidad, multicultura, característica principal de la globalización de nuestra época, globalización a la que no podemos resistirnos. Está comprobado psicológica y socialmente que los cambios producen inquietudes y miedos, pero más importante aún, desarrollan en el ser humano la habilidad de resiliencia y adaptabilidad, cualidad que nuestros niños desarrollan de manera innata desde que nacen, hasta que son permeados y contagiados por los miedos paternos. Con los nuevos límites, mi hijo deberá asistir a Seneca Valley High School, y sí, Ciertamente como familia deberemos ajustarnos, pero eso no nos resta emoción de que asista a una escuela descongestionada y equilibrada en cuanto a raza, nacionalidad e ingresos económicos. Un buen ejemplo de globalización que no es más que la interdependencia de las economías, culturas y poblaciones del mundo. Y nuestros hijos necesitan saber eso. Necesitamos desde ya enseñarles que las zonas de comodidad al final los vuelven seres limitados. Por otra parte, quiero pedirles que redoblen sus esfuerzos y definan las estrategias necesarias para minimizar el impacto en las familias cuyos hijos cambian de escuela. El apoyo de profesores y consejeros será vital, pero también considero que los alumnos que ya asisten a esas escuelas deben ser incluidos en estos programas para que perciban que los nuevos compañeros vienen a complementar y enriquecer sus experiencias educativas. Claro, para esto necesitaremos el apoyo de los padres de ambos grupos de estudiantes, los que ya están y los que llegan. Continuar reforzando además la inclusión en clases y demás programas educativos avanzados también será vital en este proceso, pues si los estudiantes se encuentran con oportunidades similares o nuevas a las ya experimentadas, eso también minimizará el impacto del cambio. Finalmente, creo que aún hay mucho trabajo por hacer, pero también creo que necesitamos trabajar y esforzarnos en conjunto y en total acuerdo, juntas, padres, maestros y estudiantes, para que cualquier meta o programa, por pequeño que sea, logre el objetivo deseado, que no es otro que un condado próspero de paz y en igualdad de condiciones para todos, asumiéndonos como seres humanos y nada más. Gracias al doctor Smith por su iniciativa y a los siete miembros de la Junta que ven la importancia de estos cambios para nuestras familias. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Quintero's interpretation. My name is Joycey Quintero, mother of a Nielsville middle school student and member of the Black and Brown Coalition for Educational Equity. I thank the Board of Education for its unwavering decision to offer true and well-balanced opportunities for the academic development of all children in the county, regardless of race, nationality, or family income. I appreciate the effort to open paths of, to multi multiculturalism the main characteristic of the globalization of our time, globalization that we cannot resist to accept. It has been psychologically and socially proven that changes produce concerns and fear, but more importantly, they develop our resilience and adaptability, a quality that our children develop as an innate fa in an innate fashion from birth until permeated by parental fears. With the new boundaries, my son will attend Seneca Valley High School, and yes, certainly as a family, we must adjust but that does not distract us from attending a less congested and balanced school in terms of race, nationality, and income. And a good example of globalization, which is nothing more than the interdependence of the world's economies, cultures, and populations. And our children need to know that. We need to show them that our comfort zones in the end create limited people. On the other hand, I want to ask you to increase your efforts and to find the necessary strategies to minimize the impact on families whose children change schools. 
The support of teachers and counselors will be vital. But I also believe that students who already attend these schools should be included in these programs so that they perceive these changes as a complement to their current programs, which will enrich their educational experiences. Of course, for this, we will need to su the support of the parents of both groups of students, those who are already there and those who will arrive. Continuing to reinforce inclusion in classes and other advanced educational programs will also be vital to this process because if students find opportunities similar or new to those already experienced, that will also minimize the impact of the change. Finally, I believe that there is still a lot of work to be done, but we also need to work together and in agreement. By together, I mean parents, teachers, and students, so that any goal or program, no matter how small, achieves the desired objective, a prosperous county of peace and equal terms for all. Thank you, Dr. Smith and the board for taking the initiative to address inequity in our county and for recognizing the, recognizing the importance of the impact of these changes on our families. Thank you. So I um, just want to thank you all for coming today and giving testimony. We really do appreciate you taking time out of your personal schedule to come and um, give comments and feedback to the board. We appreciate it. So at this time, we just say thank you. And this thank ends you. our portion of the public comments. And we will go on to... Do you mind if I... Sure, I didn't see your light. Yeah. I know you didn't. Okay. Um, the speaker that I forgot, um, it was very uh, important to hear some of the ideas that they had about gun control and that we should be talking with parents about that. Uh, these are very good ideas uh, and we will be listening to them. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, we'll move on to item seven on our agenda, board and superintendent comments. We will begin with Ms. Silvestre and go around the table. Ms. Silvestre. Um, just wanted to um, encourage families to attend the uh, boundary study sessions that the consultant WXY is putting on starting tomorrow, I believe. Um, we had a briefing on them this week and they were very informative to really explain uh, the factors of diversity, proximity, and utilization. So I think they're going to be recorded as well. I just encourage everyone to watch or to attend in person. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tidbite. So I had a pretty productive week the, the past few weeks. Yesterday, I got to visit Northwood High School, Whedon High School, Tacoma Park, and Silver Spring International all in one day, um, <laughs> which was a lot. I was definitely trying to get students to come out to my town hall that I had last night. Um, in regards to Tacoma Park and Silver Spring International, I wanted to thank the assistant principal, Aaron Barnett, at Tacoma Park Middle School. Um, he's definitely a very welcoming assistant principal, um, but also the students love him, right? And when I was in the cafeteria, the excitement around him uh, and people being comfortable to talk to him was really amazing. And I also wanted to thank the principal at Silver Spring International Middle School um, and Mr. Boston, who's the eighth grade team leader at SSI, for welcoming, Mr. For welcoming me in. Mr. Boston uh, walked me around to a few eighth grade classes, got to show me a school, but most most importantly, he told me his story, his background, what he liked about Silver Spring International. He's also the head coach um, for Silver Sp or for Springbrook High School's uh, football team. So I wanted to thank um, those members, and I hope Dr. Smith, you can thank them as well for being a basically welcoming support in their schools. Um, last night, I had a town hall at Kennedy High School, and I'm hosting town halls in different parts of the school district. Um, this town hall was attended by Ms. Brenda Wolf and Ms. Jeanette Dixon. There was really good attendance. Over 120 kids came out to that town hall, um, at least what I saw on my sign-up sheet. And it was great, right? We had a really robust conversation. Jeanette and, or Ms. Dixon and Ms. Wolf took really intense and great questions from a lot of kids. Uh, a few of the things that were brought up was ADA compliance, um, gifted and talented programs, uh, but one of them that I wanted to talk to, and I know that um, Ms. Dixon and Ms. Wolf will probably comment on them, was Be Well 365. One thing that I heard from students uh, at that town hall is that um, they, they wanted to know the, uh, the mental health initiatives that were taking in this county. And the fact that they didn't know that this initiative was going on was um, definitely hard for uh, them to, to grasp. So. 
I hope for a second, Dr. Smith, if you can re uh, talk to that, talk about that outreach plan on Be Well 365, um, and I hope we can start to work on that before I get to the rest of my comments. Sure. So, Ms. Rubens, the Ms. Rubin, the new uh, associate superintendent for student family parent engagement met with uh, Dr. McKnight and me recently and went over each of the things that they're doing. Uh, for example, if you look at the 2018 versus 2019 Mental Health Month, Mental Health Day, significant difference in the level of, of touch points for students and then each of the, the months and as they build this out, that was launched you know, last May, uh, I think May 14th board meeting, uh, as they build this out, it will touch more and more students. Uh, and there's a particular emphasis on the mental health component. We wanna make sure we pay attention in every school to the physical, uh, social and psychological well-being of students and the psychological is often the most difficult and we know that mental health uh, is certainly a function of all three areas, but most often our psychological well-being and our social interactions have the most profound effect on our mental health. So it will continue to build out over time and uh, we'll continue to talk about it at these meetings and across the system and how we, we do that work together. Appreciate that. I hope staff can take a note. Um, I'd love to work with Ms. Rubens. On we will. We will yeah. definitely arrange that. We would love to engage to your advisory council <laughs> with that office around how to do two things that I've been concerned about. One is build out what actually serves students well, yeah. because oftentimes as, as adults, we think we're doing that and, and we maybe are missing the mark somewhat. Mm -hmm. And secondly, engaging our literally tens of thousands of student Students, leaders yeah. across this county to help spread that message. Because yeah. some recent research I saw was just so compelling. And, and that is that two pieces of the research, and I've already shared it with the leadership of the school system, all of the associates and, and Ms. Rubin and everyone else. One is that we talk about how risk uh, uh, risk uh, prone students are and the research was very clear it backed up everything we all believe that between age 20 10 and 25 we're much more likely to take bigger risks around our physical well-being and around risk-taking behaviors the other half of that information that I thought was so compelling was we're more risk averse socially between 10 and 25 than at any other part time in our life. So you look at very high risk taking behaviors and very risk averse socially, and all of a sudden we understand why sometimes kids find themselves in circumstances where they do things that they don't want to do because it's a high risk behavior, but the social cost of not doing it in that moment is so great. Yeah. And this is the way we want to talk with students, learn from students, teach students, and think about all of this. The second piece was that students and, and I don't have another good label for this. The researcher who, um, who presented the information was quite interesting. She said, the kids who are most socially connected, and she said, in other words, I'll just say the cool kids are not necessarily the best messengers for their peers. The students who are the best messengers for their peers are by far the, the students who have the greatest level of positive relationship with the most different students in their school. And lots of times they're not well known in celebrity status, but they're very well known in the social interactions of the school. And so we wanna use both of those and we would love to engage you and we're going to make sure that happens right away. And the many, many students you can pull together for us to have these conversations that will shape our ongoing work around this. No, I appreciate that. And I know that um, my council is composed of a few hundred kids, but um, these town halls that I'm hosting are brand new students from, from these consortiums. That's, that's what's great. Thank um, you. And this Thursday, I wanted to mention that uh, on December 5th, there's a board of education meeting with student leaders and central office exec staff. So mm -hmm. yeah. I know that will go well. And Ms. Evans, do you want me to talk about the small election coming up? You can do it now. <laughs> so they're looking for my, they're about to look for my predecessor, right? The, the time is coming. My successor, right? <laughs> it's been a long day, right? But I appreciate Ms. Dixon had a, a comment yesterday 
um, and Miss Wolf about my term and how things are already coming to an end, so I appreciate that. Um, but the SMOB election is going to get started in early January, and we got the date for the convention, which is February 12th, um, that's coming up. and. This is a amazing opportunity. I know that I'll, I'll clip this video and bring it to students, but um, this has been a humbling experience, a rewarding experience, um, but most importantly, the election was what was eye-opening to me. Getting out to 66 schools and seeing how students are interacting with each other, how classrooms are looking, just the infrastructure of these schools at its bare site was just amazing. And you know, Dr. Smith, I'm sure you got a lot of experiences going to all these schools. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely a, an amazing experience, so I hope students get engaged in that. Mm. Was there more detail that you needed to speak about in terms of the process? We can wait till later, but you touched on it now. Yeah, um, so sophomores and juniors can run for the student seat on the school board. Um, I'll, I'll definitely put in a video later on uh, this week meeting. and next, oh, yeah, and okay. also put it in next next comments regarding specific dates and, and where to find a find the sign up list and all of that. Okay. We can do it next meeting. Okay. Okay. Sure. I just don't have them in front of me. That's okay. fine. All right. That's Appreciate fine. it. Ms. Dixon. So thank you, Madam President. Uh, first, I wanted to just uh, congratulate you uh, on your unanimous reelection as thank president uh, of the uh, board and to thank you for uh, representing us uh, you, at all of those events that you've been to this past year. You really are an iron woman in, in, in that. And I also wanted to uh, congratulate Vice President Wolf on her unanimous election uh, as vice president of the school board. And uh, I won't repeat what I told you this morning, but you know, right, okay. So um, I wanted to commend um, Nate uh, Tinbite for the town hall that he uh, actually chaired and presided over uh, last night. Um, as he said, Brenda and I had a chance to, uh, <clears throat> you know, attend with him. And um, great turnout of students. Um, the questions that uh, we responded to included um, questions about safety and security of uh, vaping, uh, mental health, um, the need for more counselors. Uh, that question kind of surprised me because we just had a mental health right. forum uh, and, uh, you know, we asked uh, folks to raise, the kids to raise their hands and not a lot did, but one student who did attend, uh, you know, talked about, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> the sessions there as well. Uh, there were questions about grading, um, questions about um, inclusion. Um, and um, we also had a uh, question about the ADA compliance at Wooten. Uh, so I'll just share that with uh, Dr. Suckerman. They wanted to know whether that was going to get fixed. And we said, absolutely, we think it will uh, yeah, get fixed, uh, you know, as well. So um, we also had, uh, you know, uh, I think healthy turnout of uh, parents and students from up county, uh, you know, that uh, had questions about the boundary uh, analysis and, um, you know, and I think, um, you know, we did a good job of honestly answering uh, the questions uh, that they had. <clears throat> so I want to take a personal um, privilege and uh, wish a happy 14th birthday uh, to my granddaughter, Morgan Elizabeth Dixon. Uh, the time has just flown by, um, you know, and it was just such a privilege to be present at her birth on December 3rd, 2005. And to think that, you know, she's this old <coughs> is, is really amazing. So anyway, I know you're not listening, Morgan, because you're in school, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody is being good to you today. And, uh, you know, you tell them that your grandma uh, said so. And of course, I love you very, very much. Um, and then uh, I just wanted to, um, you know, also say thank you. Um, uh, I, you know, I was just home on the 30th and I looked at the calendar. And, uh, yeah, you know, uh, my term on the board will end a year from now. And I thought uh, that would be a good time to, um, you know, share with, um, you know, the larger MCPS community, the voters that, um, you know, I'll be 71 on uh, December 20th. And I think it's, uh, you know, time for me to 
start doing what I want when I want to do it and uh, that sort of thing. So I made the decision uh, that I would not, uh, you know, run for re-election. Uh, you know, I'm very uh, proud of my service on the board and the opportunity to serve with all of you. And, um, you know, something that Shirley Brandman said about service, that, you know, there are other ways to serve. And um, so I did want to share that. And I share this because um, one of the things my mother taught me is always to write thank you notes. And I had over 100 messages, very nice mm -hmm. messages. Some not so nice on Bethesda Beep, you know, but uh, anyway. You know, I noticed, though, that those people never put their name out. Okay, they hide behind something. But that's okay. That doesn't bother me. Uh, you know, I have a thick skin. But um, I just wanted to say thank you um, to all of the people who answered on Twitter, uh, sent me, uh, you know, personal emails uh, as well. Um, you know, it was nice to see that, um, you know, people know what I've done here. And uh, so uh, thank you for that. I did want to say that um, I also decided to do that at that time because I want those who are interested in the position, because I think it's, you know, maybe time for generational change, but to have time to raise the money uh, that it will take to run. Uh, I know the last time when Pat and Carla ran, uh, I think they had to spend more than the job pays. So, uh, you know, uh, that's an important piece. And then to fashion a campaign and to really learn uh, some more about what the board does, uh, you know, as well. I really, really do believe in uh, voting. Uh, I believe in democracy. I believe in people uh, having choices. And uh, so I will mention that, you know, Ms. Evans and Ms. Mondrowski posts are up too, but uh, we'll see, you know, if you, you might not get any opponents. But you do have to uh, file with the elections board, I think it's $25, by, is it 25th, Pat, or? 24th uh, of January. 24th. 2020. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, I don't plan on doing any endorsements, that's up to the voters. But, um, you know, certainly if folks have any questions, I'm happy to answer answer those as well. And it's very, very worthwhile, this work uh, that we do here. And uh, so I just wanted to say thank you to everybody, but I really can't write me that many uh, <laughs> notes. And, uh, and I do want to thank Caitlin, because I'm wondering whether she trolls Twitter, because I had just finished and then I had a call from her. Uh, and uh, I thought you wrote a nice article. It really captured my thoughts. And, um, you know, so I wanted to say thank you for that uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Mrs. Mondrowski. Thank you. Yep, I'll be short. I just wanted to uh, start off by saying congratulations to our officers. Look forward to working with you this year. Um, and um, that I hope everybody had a fantastic Thanksgiving. Um, it was an interesting time with everything going on, at least for me personally, um, to really think about the things that I'm thankful for. And so, um, Hopefully everyone, and I am thankful for all of the work that everybody does here. Um, my colleagues um, and the system, our superintendent and all of his staff, um, I'm very appreciative for everything that everybody does. So um, I had a wonderful time spending time with family and reflecting on all things that matter. And with that in my reflection, I do want to say that while I truly in my heart believe some people um, don't know me as well as maybe they should before making judgments um, that I hope that you know as time goes on we can all work together to ensure success for every single one of our students um, I believe that you know we have all of our schools are great schools and um, and that everyone you know um, needs to come together and recognize that and embrace each other and um, hopefully we can proceed with a very positive experience going forward thank you Thank you. Ms. Wolf. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit. Actually, I want to brag a little bit on Springbrook High School and the students that go there. I had an opportunity to attend their Challenge by Choice Awards. And those are awards given to their students who have taken a number of AP and IB exams. And so they had 132 AP Scholar Awards. Now, only 74 of the students were still at the school because the others had graduated. Mm -hmm. 
but there are different levels of AP scholars. And if you'll bear with me a moment, I want to share this with you. They had 89 AP scholars. That means that these students received three or higher on three AP exams. They had 16 AP scholars with honors. That means that these students received scores of three or higher on four or more exams. They had an AP, they had 23 AP scholars with distinction. Those students received 3.5 on all AP exams taken and they had to score three or higher on five or more. Exciting, isn't it? It is. Yes. Yeah, and they also had their AP, I mean their IB awards data. They had seven students with a score of five, three students with a score of six, and one student received a seven, which is, I guess, the equivalent of a perfect score. They had 30% of their students scored higher than the world average, and they had 55% of their test takers passing the IB exam. I was just thoroughly impressed by that. And most, mostly because when we talked about expanding the regional program, we want people to understand that they're not going to anything that's less than. They're going to something that is great over there, too. But I also wanted to mention there was a young lady there named Jay Kilgore. She wrote her own lyrics and music and played for the... Um, award ceremony. It was absolutely fabulous. And I wouldn't want to be remiss and not mention two of our teachers who got a lot of acclaim. Miss LaRosa Jones, Arroyo, she had 100% of her students who got a three or higher on their AP exam. And Mr. Chicas, he teaches AP Spanish language and culture. He surpassed the Maryland State goal as well. Just wanted to brag a little. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Will. Mrs. O'Neill. Yes, I wanted to piggyback on Ms. Silvestri's comments about the uh, bo countywide boundary analysis and the first forum uh, is tomorrow evening at Gaithersburg mm -hmm. High School. There's a series of six. Also, we've received a number of emails from people. Some of them are kind of interesting, but no decisions have been made, none. And we're in phase one, and um, we have been briefed um, by the consultant about information that will be presented uh, at, the, at the community meetings. And I urge folks to attend those meetings go to the website, fill in, they're gonna have an online survey, um, but to stay informed, but know that no decisions have been made and that the recommendations for the consultants will come to the board in June and they will not include specific schools or clusters because some of the information uh, I saw in my neighborhood listserv and I thought, hmm, does somebody know something I don't know? Because um, it was quite interesting. So um, also, I wanted to comment about the Moms Demand Action. I mean, I truly believe in their work. And we, a while ago, we had a um, representative from the Montgomery County Brady campaign. They showed a video here. We put them in touch with the county PTA and it went nowhere because it's not just what the Board of Education can do, it's parents, it's the entire community, it's the entire country. I mean, every day I hold my breath when I hear the lead in on the radio or TV on news, another school shooting. And I have to say a prayer that it never happens here in Montgomery County. Well, I guess two years ago we had a, a gun brought to Clarksburg High School. Thank goodness a student told and the quick actions of the school resource officer, security, the teacher, prevented a tragedy. Yesterday, outside of Milwaukee, a student pulled a handgun in a classroom, and thanks to the uh, quick thinking of the uh, school resource officer, that student was shot, but no other students were injured in that. You know, I've been on the board since Columbine happened, I couldn't believe it when 
Sandy Hook happened and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and on and on and on. And, you know, I, I do believe that we need to consider what the moms demand action and see if there's additional steps we can take. But we really need partnership with MCCPTA because it's a whole county issue, not just MCPS. When the ha shooting happened at Saugus, I in Saugus, in Santa Clarita, one thing that um, I was struck by, they were interviewing a choral music teacher who, when the shooting stopped, grabbed the trauma bag from her classroom and applied emergency first aid to one of the shooting victims um, before first responders got there. And I know there's a nationwide effort uh, because of all these tragic events with guns on Stop the Bleed. And I just wonder, I know Dr. Zuckerman at one point had mentioned efforts on Stop the Bleed, but I was struck by one, the trauma bag in the music teacher's classroom. I wonder what efforts we are, you know, how system-wide on Stop the Bleed training that we, you know, whether it, well, let's, listen, there was a shooting at Walmart in Texas in El Paso. Mm -hmm. You know, what efforts are we making, um, and God forbid the worst happened, to be prepared to help victims um, of gun violence? But we also need to be working with all who can help us as a county, a state, a nation in preventing for further gun violence. Dr. Smith? So, Dr. Zuckerman can give you a an update, we actually met with a uh, state uh, organization and officials from Stop the Bleed this summer and started doing system-wide work around this very topic. So, Dr. Zuckerman. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Smith, and thank you for the question, uh, Ms. O'Neill. We actually have partnered with the Montgomery County Department of uh, Homeland Security and Emergency Management. They have a grant to put Stop the Bleed kits in all of our schools. And so we are currently in the beginning phases of that where um, they are going through all of our schools, assessing where to put the kits um, in different parts of the hallways. Um, and then we will proceed with training. Our security staff members are being trained. The nurses um, through HA, the Health and Human Services Department have been trained, and then we'll build out from there. So we are in the process of implementing the Stop the Bleed program in Montgomery County. We're just at the very beginning phases of it and have this year um, to partner with the county to spend the money in the grant. And on the curriculum side, Dr. Navarro was part of that conversation. And to uh, build this same sort of learning into our uh, high school student curriculum. And, the, and the, it was a very interesting meeting we had this summer and how we can be pervasive in teaching people this for all sorts of reasons, whether it's uh, uh, the tragedy and horrific, I say, evilness of people that do things this, like this, but also the um, accidents that happen on the athletic field or what, what happens in your own home when you trip and fall and just helping people understand what a tourniquet is, how to stop the bleed, how to save someone's life in those moments before those first responders get there. So thank you for pointing that out. Dr. Daka. Okay, I too would like to congratulate you on your reelection. I think you have represented us well in the last year and we thank you for your service and I uh, thank um, Ms. Wolf for accepting the position as vice president. Uh, and I want to, I'm going to take a little time to do this because a reporter grilled me one night when he, she couldn't get anybody else. I happened to answer. <laughs> I'm, and I'm dead serious about that. She wanted to know, well, what are you going to do when you have all those women on the board? And I said, each one brings something to the board. Um, Ms. Dixon brings her, ex her extensive background in education and her determination when she thinks an idea is a good one. And then you have Mr. Mondrowski who has a real feel for students uh, who need to achieve well or who have some problems and she's heading up the uh, committee that works on that kind of thing. So she's very involved with that and she brings that to us. 
And I want to thank you, Ms. Wolf, for talking about Springbrook and putting all those scores out there. This is so important because we have people who are saying, and we've talked about this before, this is not new on the board, that people are saying, well, you have an IB program in that school, but it's not as good as the one in another school. And to, to give us those scores shows that it's very, very important and that schools that are uh, in other parts of the county uh, have their programs and have kids that can really achieve very well. And I, I thank, um, thank Miss Evans for uh, her leadership. And I remember when I first met her, she was involved at Harmony Hills and they were putting this garden in mm -hmm. and she forced them somehow to come up with $3,000 from the school system to make this garden uh, appropriate for students. You don't remember. I remember. Make the, I remember. <laughs> appropriate for students for their study. Uh, on different kinds of plants. There are food plants and other kinds of plants, but that was her beginning, and her students, of course, have um, been in the school system. And I, I've said this before, there are some of our leaders out here who really complain about the schools, but their kids are in private school. It just <laughs> upsets right. me. And of course, right. we have uh, Ms. O'Neill, who knows everything about the school <laughs> system. She remembers everything, mm -hmm. and she's very reasonable, and she scolded people last week. I don't know whether any of you remember that, but it was the <laughs> nicest scold, you know, <laughs> that and it just covered everything Absolutely. very nicely. We appreciate it. We appreciate your courage on doing that and other things. Mm -hmm. And we're so excited to have Ms. Silvestre, who is welcomed by the Latino community and the other communities as well, and should be because she brings us her extensive background in community work activ activist, as an activist and also from um, the college level. Uh, we really appreciate that. And I also wanted to say that um, I definitely appreciate Nick Tinbite. Tim I'm so glad that your, um, your programs, your town halls are working well with students. I've been to one of them and uh, the kids are really involved and they're really asking good questions and you're able to handle all that. And, I, pre I really appreciate your dedica dedication and the fact that you still are in school. <laughs> and you're such a great representative for Kennedy, and the students that came today were a great representative mm -hmm. for Kennedy, because mm -hmm. again, we're hearing that some schools in the part of the county are, mm, we just don't think we want to send our kids there, but <laughs> you could see the kind of background these students had. I want to thank Mr. Williams uh, who did the Minority Scholars mm -hmm. to begin with for 13 years, mm -hmm. and now it's in almost every high school. And Ms. Singal, who is the teacher of mm -hmm. Latin American Studies. And I also want to say that Kennedy has this course. There are not many schools that have this kind of course, mm -hmm. um, Latin American mm -hmm. Studies and History and Culture. So we really appreciate that. Um, the last thing I, I wanted to talk about, oh, two things, consulting teachers. We heard them speak today. It's not like we haven't talked about it, and we know that this is one of the positive things that attract people to this school system. They know that they will get some support if they're new, and our consulting program is one of those. We know how hard they work, and we have also talked about that. Um, the uh, Latino dance, um, the Latino dance competition, uh, we did attend last week, Ms. Silvestre and I, and her reception there was tremendous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really, they were so excited. The parents were so excited to have her there. And we did give a proclamation from all of us for the Latino dance. And Latino dance has been around about 13 years as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's grown tremendously. And the parents put a lot into it. The kids put a lot into it. And our staff mm -hmm. devotes quite a number uh, of hours to it. And I'm sorry that all of us couldn't be there, but when you see how well they are performing and how they're representing the culture from their countries, mm -hmm. and they're dressed like they're on Broadway. I know, right? And they act like they're on Broadway. It's, well, we've talked about our, the talent in our schools, and when we go to the superintendent's gala for um, drama and uh, music, it's very obvious that we have very gifted talent in the school system and they present a lot for the schools. Mm -hmm. So I, I really wanted to thank you all for uh, you. working so hard mm -hmm. and bringing so many gifts. Yeah. Yeah. We appreciate no. you too, Judy. Absolutely. Yes. So and all that. you bring. Yeah.
right? Determined you are as well. <laughs> yes, you are. Now, you, you said exactly all the things I was going to say. You, you went on about each colleague, and I definitely echo your comments. And then could you say which new schools um, participate in the Latin competition? I know John F. Kennedy was one, but there were a couple other, I thought. Do you remember, Ms. Silvestre? You know? Okay. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yes. There are a couple of new schools. Okay. BCC didn't have enough males, so girls danced together. Okay. But it's it's just really exciting because they have great routines anyway, and we always love seeing the parents dance with the students. Yes, I do. I love that part too. Miss Did Sylvester? Carla dance? Did, did you dance? No. Yeah. Not this year. Not this year. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say, I think it would be nice if the board, if we did some yeah. kind of skit or something, because I'm really jealous about the one that the administration did at the beginning. <laughs> I'm you totally know, okay with that. A and S, totally okay. waiting, they were they? <laughs> fabulous, fabulous. I still, think, yeah. I'm game if you are, okay. Mrs. Uh, right. Smadrasi. Just two little things that I just wanted mm -hmm. to mention in thinking about it. Um, in reference to uh, Mr. Timbite's uh, discussion about the town hall and stuff. Um, I do want to continue working with you to put together, um, you know, Ananya, I had put together a student um, panel of me about mental health panel, and unfortunately it wasn't able to be recorded, and I'd love to put something like that together mm -hmm. again, because yeah. we really do get our best information of what kids are experiencing in their schools from the kids, <laughs> and even yeah. though we might think we're doing stuff, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that we are, and I'm sure we're doing a lot of it very well. It's, it's like out of the mouths of babes type of thing, even though they're not babes. But <laughs> um, So I would really look forward to continuing to work on that. Um, and then I, the last thing I just wanted to throw out there was, um, I had almost forgotten, it's today is Giving Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And so for anyone listening who has charities or organizations, including the MCPS Education okay. Foundation, That's right. that they would like to throw some support behind, today is a great day to do that. So thank, thank you, thank Mrs. Madrowski. Ms. Wolf. Mine is a quick comment. If I heard it last night at uh, Mr. Tenbite's town hall. There were students who still didn't seem to know where to go in their building if they needed mental health supports. And I know that you're still rolling out Be Well 365, but it seems to me there must be some kind of communication that yes. we could send out to inform students what they should be doing. Because I, you know, it was kind of shocking to find out that they still felt that there was no one in their school they could go to. Okay. Thank, you. Have, Thank you for telling me. It'd be me great that. if we could do a, like an, an assembly in the beginning of the school year where everybody could be introduced. But okay. so, Dr. Smith, comments? I'd just like to say that, um, as I said earlier, we will reproduce the letter that we received today on gun violence and uh, we will come back to the board with um, some information too about things that are being done and trends and best uh, thinking going forward about that because it frankly is every single time that news report comes on. First I get sick in to my stomach and then I think I have to quit my job. I can't do this anymore. And it's not about me, it's just how I react to such horrific, terrible things that happen and we have to pay attention and be vigilant. So we will come back to you with a uh, the, the thinking around how to proceed to be part of the solution. We can never be all of the solution, but we can be part of that solution. Um, also, I would just uh, ask Mr. Turner, if we could just uh, tweet out three or four times this afternoon and tomorrow, the dates and times of the boundary analysis meetings. Let's just flood the airways with that mm -hmm. since it's been discussed here. Uh, today also, with the Maryland State Board of Education is releasing the state report cards. I've been talking for two years about the fact that for the first time when they're released, that there will be the per pupil actual expenditures on them. And then I learned a few weeks ago that the Maryland State Department of Education is not putting those numbers on the report cards today. Those will come five or six months from now. I don't really know why they made that decision, but we've been talking about it, thinking about it. Part of our resource study discussion was around that. 
And so I just want to make everyone aware that, that those numbers have been delayed by the Maryland State Department of Education. And we will uh, continue to be in conversation and keep you informed as to when they will appear. Now, when we look at this second report card in this era, because for a few years there we didn't have state report cards as the state shifted its assessment, went through the race to the top efforts and those things in 14, 15, 16, 17. The first ones came out last December in 18 after not existing for a few years. There are some changes from last year which will make comparisons difficult. Last year it, the, the report card did not include the student survey at all levels, nor did it include at fifth and eighth grade, which affects elementary schools and middle schools, the state science assessment scores. Those have been added this year. And in uh, upcoming years, there will be a social studies assessment in grade eight that will be added to it. So it is a continue, continue to evolve over time. Um, it is important to note that this is a requirement of the Every Student Succeeds Act of 2015. And while it gives information, it does not give a complete picture of the uh, work of a school. Um, I think in particular it doesn't give a complete understanding of the impact of a school on the students who have experienced disparities in learning and uh, performance over the years, uh, students in poverty, students of color, especially African American students and Hispanic Latino students. And so that was the reason that the complementary a program was developed here in Montgomery County, the equity accountability model. And so as you look at that, you can look at the two different sets of information and you can get a, a reasonably good idea then of a school's impact for all students across a lot of different topics. They do use multiple measures with the state report card as does the evidence of learning and equity accountability model. But in terms of the levels of learning, they can only use the state assessment. They do not have other ways of, of doing that outside of the state assessment. Um, so that's, that's information that will be coming out today. It's going to be in all the newspapers and uh, certainly information that uh, uh, we want to pay attention to as we think and strive on how to make sure every school is meeting the needs of, of each child. It's also this month that we'll be recommending a budget, a system-wide budget to the Board of Education on December 18th. Um, the budget's a technical document full of a lot of numbers and information. And so on the 18th, what we'll do is give the most uh, core work that we're doing and changes to the budget. And then we'll spend from December 18th until mid-February having community conversations and Board of Education conversations around that budget. The board will make the changes they deem necessary in the budget and then at the end of February by state law it will go to the uh, county executive who will incorporate it into his budget to be released as a part of a countywide budget in mid-March. Uh, and then the county council will take it up in April and May and vote at the end of May and that will be our 2000 21 budget starting on July 1st, 2020 for that school year. So that is upcoming on December 18th at 6.30 in the evening. Uh, we are broadcasting it because it makes it much more accessible to many more people than when we just choose one site in one part of the county and give a, a public presentation. And um, I think we are very fortunate in Montgomery County uh, to have uh, been well resourced over the, the years by the community. I would also remind everyone that the, the number of students has grown tremendously and the needs of students in the world, whether we're talking about physical, social, psychological health and mental health, whether we're talking about making sure everyone reads on grade level or above by the end of third grade, access to the most rigorous programming for all children, making sure that we have highly effective uh, skilled educators in every school and in this building and in every classroom and the challenge in a tight labor market that's even tighter around education than it is in the general labor market. So all of those things are particularly important as we continue to build out uh, the recommended budget and then the board wrestles with all of the issues and the competing interests and moves forward a budget to the, the county government. Um, but it is a particularly important 
uh, part of the work and something that we pay very close attention to together. And I would just like to end by saying uh, thank you very much, not only to Ms. Evans and Ms. O'Neill uh, for your leadership this year, but to all the board members. Yeah. You, know, I, you know, school systems are complex, difficult, uh, interesting, wonderful places. And you certainly working with you makes it uh, a very good thing uh, for me in my job. And I mean that sincerely to the, each one of you and to all of the board office staff. I think it's, um, it's quite impressive when a group of people come together and work on behalf of students and can figure out how to sort through everything that as human beings we have to sort through to make decisions together on behalf of students and I just I feel very thankful and fortunate for each of you and for what you contribute to our community and to the school system in particular so I just want to echo that thankfulness and I mean that very much yeah no thank you um Ms. Evans sure one, one other thing I'm sorry to interrupt like this but I think it's important I know there was a question about from the students who to whom should I go in the school if I have a concern about anything that has to do with mental health or physical or anything academics as well but uh, our office has a function ombudsman ombudsperson <laughs> and anybody can call into the office and it will be directed to the right uh, person or the right uh, division in the school system and I think we may not be emphasizing that enough but people really need to know where they can go if they need help Dr. Smith. I did make a note. I make extensive notes during these meetings, and I was very distraught to hear that, frankly. And so before the winter holidays, we will be showing something mm -hmm. in every school, in every classroom that says, these are who these people are, this is what you do in your school, and we'll do that for the middle and high schools. So that will be done before the winter break. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Smith, for your comments. And um, just want to say congratulations to Ms. Wolf. I'm looking forward to working with you um, in this capacity. And just want to thank Mrs. O'Neill. She has a breadth and wealth of knowledge. And I'm just glad that you're just two seats away, that you're still here. <laughs> um, we were in a meeting yesterday, and um, someone asked a question about something that happened like eons ago. And Mrs. O'Neill could quote the policy, the time, the date, and the people, and everything. So I just, I really do appreciate that, and um, just want to say thank you to all my colleagues, and just really looking forward to continuing our work together. Um, so Mrs. Um, Smadrowski mentioned Thanksgiving, and um, it was a tough holiday for my family, but I do want to acknowledge um, I had a death in the family. It was a, it was like a mother to me, um, so I wanted to mention her because education was very important in our family, and um, it was never a question um, as to whether or not we would go to college. It was just a matter of where you were going to go, and so I mentioned her because um, she promoted going to a historically black college. She went to Central State University and was a definitely a huge um, reason why um, I chose an HBCU and I chose um, my degree. Her degree was in accounting. She was a professor at Central State University. And so we just had her um, funeral over the holiday. And so um, just a lot of um, who I am is because of my family, right? And so um, while it is um, very sad, uh, just thankful for the memories. So I just wanted to acknowledge her, especially as I go into um, an event that I wanted to mention around um, building our network of diversity. I was on the panel for the third annual Bond Summit on November the 14th, and the summit was titled Analyzing Workforce Diversity and the Impact of Male Educators of Color on Male Students of Color. I was on the panel along with Dr. Um, Ramon Goings, professor um, at Loyola University School of Education, um, Mrs. Zakia Zakia. Zankara Jabbar, she's an MCPS parent. Her son, I believe he attends, um, he, he attends, um, he attended Drew Elementary School, but he is at Francis Scott Key um, Middle School right now, and she's also connected with racial, 
racial justice now. And Mr. Doug um, Rivera was also on the panel. He's a school ESOL. He's one of our ESOL counselors. He's also an MSP sponsor at Quince Orchard High School, along with Mr. Brandon Wallace. He's a professor at Montgomery College right across the way in the School of Education. So I just wanted to acknowledge the panelists that I sat alongside. And we also had a student, and I am so sorry that I do not have his name. Um, we had a student, and um, I just appreciate that we have bond here in our school system and that you know we had a discussion about what we're all grappling with you know trying to not only diversify our our workforce our employees but also finding male educators of color there's a shortage um, nationwide but i appreciate the work that the system is continuing to do to make certain that we um think about how to grow our own as well as what we do differently to attract, retain, and recruit um, male educators of color. And Dr. Smith, there's like, you say so many different things, but the one thing that always sticks with me is that we don't have to sit, be sick to get better. Mm -hmm. And so while we are not a perfect system, we are always trying to find ways to get better, and I appreciate that, and just appreciate the conversation that we're continuing to have, and that we have um, a place where men of color can go to talk, to help one another, to support each other, and to, to say, keep holding on, this is worth it, and um, just appreciative of the people that um, continue to do this work and they not only do this work here in Montgomery County public school system, but they're willing to share best practices um, with other districts in mm -hmm. the state of Maryland and on a national level as well. They are really um, getting called and pulled to come and share their work. And so I'm just honored that we have them here and that we continue to lift them up, Absolutely. right? As they do this work. And so I will not, um, uh, oh, no, I did want to mention um, just one last point I wanted to make. I, I am very proud of all of our students and just, and I don't think I'm biased because my child goes to John F. Kennedy High School and because our student board member is from John F. Kennedy High School, maybe a little bit, but um, just really good to see our students come here and um, stand up for what they believe in and just want to give um, a shout out to their teachers, Mr. Williams and um, Ms. Singo. We were able, myself, Dr. Dr and Ms. Wolf were able to go in front of their class um, on November the 26th. I remember that day, it was my daughter's birthday, and just hear from them, but I'm encouraged that our students are, are not shy in wanting to um, have their voices heard and come before us to, um, to talk about what they're learning from their, their teachers mm -hmm. and, and how they um, want to see that if we are going to put information out there that um, that is always accurate, right? And That's that it right. informs mm -hmm. and um, that where it's offensive that we try to make adjustments. So just wanted to share that. And um, at this point, I will move on to committee updates. If there are committee chairs that want to share any updates here today. No, um, just that the uh, Fiscal Management Committee will meet on the 12th at uh, 10. December 12th? Okay. Are There'll there? be a special policy management committee, committee meeting on uh, December 19th at 3 o'clock to review the comments on JEE, our transfer policy mm -hmm. that's out for public comments. So if people have comments, they should write in. Okay. Absolutely. So seeing no other lights, I'm assuming no other chairs have any information to share. I, we will go on to our next item on the agenda. And I will hand it over to Dr. Smith, the item of discussion. Yes. So the school calendar is always a topic of great conversation and discussion. And uh, it's just so um, important to hold in our minds that every family is unique. Every group of people that come together and create a family um, have different interests, different circumstances, different uh, faiths, belief systems, all sorts of things. And so as we think about that, uh, we do this work in the context of what has happened in the past and how that 
shifts and moves and is adjusted going forward. And so uh, it's, there's been a lot of conversation this season about next year's calendar and the staff has worked very hard and I would like to just publicly thank uh, not only the two individuals in front of you, but many, many others, Dr. Zuckerman and Ms. McGuire, for their uh, efforts around this and knowledge. And I think we're ready to come to you today uh, with a recommendation and a way of thinking about this. And we do appreciate the uh, flexibility that was uh, shown by uh, those folks who create the advanced placement program and their <laughs> schedules that have been very set for a very long time, but they did show some flexibility in their response to us when we discussed this back in early November and responded right away, or even October, I think it was, I don't remember which, but it's uh, it's an important document and we need to get this moving forward because it, now a tremendous number of people will make a lot of plans based on a calendar that will start next uh, fall. So I'll, with that, I'll turn over to uh, Dr. Zuckerman and Ms. McGuire. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, indeed, it's been a dynamic and fluid and evolving process um, this year, just like it has been the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think your recognition of, of the advanced placement exam is a really good example of that. So it just goes to show you how far we've come over the last few months. So we're going to just walk through the um, very briefly. Uh, just where the superintendent is recommending to the board to uh, adopt a calendar, and then we're happy to answer questions and discuss anything that's on your mind. <clears throat> Thank you. And this, um, we have had a number of um, uh, briefings and discussions with the board and the community and the public and the policy management committee um, around the calendar development. The timeline does begin back in June of this year um, and, and again it's been a, a very extensive process um, with a lot of work both internally um, with our elected officials and with um, our internal and external stakeholders um, and we are uh, at the conclusion of that process for this year um, again we have really we're very encouraged by the um, large number of responses that we received um, online to our survey uh, as well as just in the form of written correspondence phone calls emails um, all of that that feedback was definitely um, digested and cataloged and uh, gone through. We did get over 13,000 responses through the web and again um, a large number of, um, of emails and other correspondence as well as specific discussions with stakeholders in different groups. Uh, and so we really did talk through a lot of different angles to this calendar and some that we um, have had uh, changing parameters. This is the first year that we have not had the constraints on the beginning and the end of the school year, which of course creates a whole different conversation again for us to have uh, around the calendar. The parameters that we are working with um, are the state mandated closures, uh, and these are listed here, and of course our calendar does uh, take account of all of those. We also, of course, are taking account of the recent change that the board made um, regarding the policy on inauguration to make that a permissive um, closure uh, with consideration for what the operational features are of each individual calendar uh, as it is developed. And so the recommendation that the superintendent is bringing before you today for your consideration, we are bringing you um, a recommendation both for the traditional school year as well as for the innovative school year calendar. So both of those calendars are before you today. Um, and then of course we will, um, following the board's action, communicate those both up to the state. So I'll walk briefly through the elements of the traditional school year calendar first. The first day of school would be August 31st, 2020. Uh, the last day of school, June 16th, 2021. There are 182 instructional days in this calendar, and that does reflect our um, pa practice from the past few years. It does return to a full spring break, six non-instructional days encompassing two weekends. Um, and of course, we did hear pretty broadly that that was a, um, an important feature for our community. We are also able to return to the full professional development day for planning and grading at the end of each quarter. And again, that professional development time within the school year is very important to our, uh, to our schools and our staff to have, that, uh, to have that time within the school year. We are compliant with the state requirements to have possible makeup days both within the school year as well as extending the school year. 
We have one non-instructional day aligning with Rosh Hashanah, and the superintendent's recommendation does include two professional days that align with Lunar New Year and Eid al-Fitr. The recommendation is to be open on Inauguration Day, which is January 20th, 2021, and the calendar includes a total of seven early release days. And there's the graphic that goes along with that. Ms. McGuire, I would just remind everyone the reason that we want to identify makeup days, both within, in particular, the second semester of the school year as well as at the end of the school year is the Maryland State Board of Education regulation does not allow for the Maryland State Board to provide a waiver to school days in times like Snowmageddon of 2010 mm -hmm. when you miss so many days unless you've built those features into your calendar. So you don't have to put them in, but if you don't put them in, the state might waive two days of school for everyone when you've missed 15, and you cannot have those waived if you do not put those features in. That's why it's so critical to put them in. Um, of course, we are also bringing to you an innovative school year calendar, which applies to the Arcola and Roscoe Nix elementary schools. These scenarios reflect 210 instructional days, which again uh, reflects that extended um, school year and that innovative calendar. Um, we are continuing the practice here of aligning the two calendars when both schools are open. So if they're uh, either the entire school system is in session or out of session, we, we do have alignment in the instructional and non-instructional days during the traditional school year. However, there are, of course, um, many other educational and instructional features that differ for the innovative calendar, and primarily those relate to the length of, of quarters, when the conferences may be held, early release days, and professional development days. And the innovative school year calendar does have a total of 17 early release days, which is um, really a feature, again, of how that uh, those schools are making use of some of that important planning and development time for their um, teachers and their school communities, as well as having some additional breaks through the year. And that's the graphic that represents that uh, recommendation. And that concludes the presentation. Okay. We'll start with um, Mr. Tinbite. you have any comments, thoughts? Um, no, no comments or questions. I'm happy that uh, College Board made changes in terms of um, their AP testing. That That's definitely great after all of the community response. Appreciate this recommendation. Ms. Dixon. So, um, you know, I will uh, go on record as, uh, you know, supporting uh, the school system closing on inauguration day uh, for lots of reasons, uh, you know, related to. Uh, you know, um, history, the importance of the presidency, just everything related to constitutional government uh, as well. I did notice that, did we get this from you that showed the um, other systems in the area that are open uh, or, I mean, closed on Inauguration Day? And uh, for 2020 to 2021, it looks like... Um, D.C. is closed, um, Arlington, and um, the others that right now know but have proposed to close, uh, which would be um, Fairfax and, um, no, Fairfax will be open. Um, yeah, no, they'll be open. And they already voted on that 725-19, uh, uh, but the other two, um, are proposing Alexandria and uh, PG. So, but other than that, I have no other questions. Okay. So if you don't have your light on, you mean, uh, oh, no. I can pass you. I was just gonna associate myself with my, uh, Mr. Timbite's comments. Thank you very much for the work on this and we're very happy that we were able to make things work for our community, so thank you. Ms. Wolf. Um, I just want to understand one thing. You have seven early release days for the regular calendar and 17 for the innovative. Why, why such a big difference when it's not that many more days? So it's not that many more days, but it really does sort of reflect the different breaks and priorities mm -hmm. um, that, the, that the innovative school year calendar has. So for example, their quarters uh, end at different times, and they wanted to uh, include a, a, an early release day to allow for a little bit of 
that planning and grading at the end of those quarters, so that adds a number of days, as well as um, adding days uh, of early release days for conferences, and just having a few more of those to build in for breaks, um, so that they could have some of that extended time as a break. So that was just an interest that those schools expressed in terms of, again, having a little more flexibility with their time. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. O'Neill. Yes, um, I too want to thank you for your all your work, and I just want to note, um, I really am appreciative that the college board listened yes. to us. You know, some of my colleagues know I like us to write letters and make requests, <laughs> and we're not always successful, but this time our voices were heard, yes. and uh, I, I am grateful that the college board um, considered the impact on not just Montgomery County students, but Muslim students across the country. Um, you know, uh, New York City, which has a million students in its district, um, it, you know, it, it posed a dilemma for everyone. Um, you know, I, in the best of all worlds, we would start the day after Labor Day and close by Memorial Day, sort of the calendar of the swimming pool. You know, um, people, when they we hit Memorial Day and the pool's open, everybody's mindset goes to summer vacation. But you can't fit in 182 school days, you know, in, in that kind of scenario. So, you know, it is remarkable that we had 13,000 responses to the online survey plus many letters and emails. Um, and I think it was about 10,000 wanted us to start before Labor Day because when you lay out the scenario of if we started September 8th, we would end like June 22nd. Right. And God forbid that you would have a snowmageddon, right. we'd be bumping up against the 4th of July. July. So. Um, you know, I think that this calendar uh, accommodates many things. I, you know, seven half days when we have um, the pro full professional days scattered throughout the, the at the end of marking periods, half days are a pain for working parents. And I, when I came on the board, we were up at about a dozen uh, half days. My, my grandchildren go to a school system where they have a half day every other week. And um, it's costly because you're paying for childcare. So, I, you know, I, I would like to think that there's some way around it. I mean, seven is better than a dozen. But, um, you know, I think that this calendar balances things. As I've said before, I think that if we, since the superintendent's recommendation is to be open on inauguration day i would like us to have um you know an instructional program um that relates to the inauguration and have it on tv because it is an important element of our democratic process it's one of the most important elements and uh has historical significance no matter how the movie ends in 2020, you know, that script hasn't been written, mm -hmm. but um, I do think that we should have a guided instructional program. So I'm gonna actually, I know Judy and Carla, have, I'm gonna move the calendar for recommendation from the superintendent. I have to okay. talk to you. I know, oh, I know, okay. but, but she did. it should have been on the table at the outset. Oh, that's true. So okay. you wanna so second second it. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded, so we'll go ahead, Dr. Docker, you can finish. Megan, go ahead. Um, Ms. O'Neill reminded me that I went to a school in a school system that closed in May so kids could pick cotton. So we have moved a long way from that. But anyway, I wanted to say that I'm really glad that we have the professional days for Lunar New Year and for Eid al-Fitir. Uh, I think that's really important. And the other part, uh, giving the full uh, day, professional day to teachers at the end of the marking period is really important. I used to fuss with Dr. Zuckerman about it. The half day doesn't work because they don't get out of school until one or two o'clock in the day because the kids are there and they have to be, but well anyway, I'm really glad that we're going to be able to put the full day in and I appreciate your help on that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sebestri. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the community engagement around the calendar planning process. Uh, is it correct that we do have a committee that works with you in developing the calendar? 
So yes, we've taken um, sort of a, a little bit of a different approach over the past few years because of the evolving nature. We have sort of internal um, staff uh, work groups that begin the process just of putting the functional components together and then we work with a, a group of external stakeholders to kind of have that feedback um, and development process continue so it's sort of in those two stages okay so I just encourage people that are passionate about this topic to reach out to you to become if not they're not already on your list to get on your list so that they can hear about what's in the works uh, every year and are not surprised by some of the barriers that we might encounter in the future. Absolutely, and we've tried to work with um, our various advocacy groups, community groups, the, the county's um, interfaith advisory group. So we've really tried to reach out to those different groups and have that participation in the stakeholder discussions. But we're always happy to reach more people and have those conversations. Yeah. Thank you. I, I also, I also just, just would add that the process in which we put the calendar out for feedback as well as what happens at the mm -hmm. board table with public comment is hugely informative and and a very powerful feedback mechanism so it's part of the process so i don't want to discount right. that aspect of it there are a, s a small number of people who put proposals together that then essentially get stress tested in the public domain mm -hmm. and i think that's what you saw over the last few months and i to me it's it's exactly the way a democratic process should work and mm -hmm. does work and it brought us to the point today yeah, i was just touched uh, by some of the m the many uh, testimonies that we receive but if we don't have to alarm parents or if we can be uh, put out information as much as possible to avoid um, just misinformation just you know, the, the constant information that we have to put out so par parents feel that they know what's going on and they don't have to get alarmed if they don't have to be alarmed or if they do need to be alarmed they can coalesce and do their own advocacy as needed oh, thank you can we be reminded is there a student representative on the calendar committee as well so we certainly work with students. I think that sort of similar to what we're saying, you know, it, uh, many years ago there mm -hmm. was a committee that really did most of that work. Mm -hmm. And I think that similar to some of our other processes, we find that now there are so many ways to reach out to folks and to communicate with folks. We don't really try to work through a structured committee. We again have um, this kind of iterative process where we broaden the communication through okay. all of those different avenues. And I think that's the piece where, um, again, there's just a lot of different touch points and opportunities for that kind of information to come out and hopefully that way it's a little less bounded than a than a small group would be okay. that said we absolutely um, have have reached out to students directly mm -hmm. as well as I did participate in mr. Tim bites um, one of his uh, student uh, town halls to answer that's questions right. and have that sort of broad-based discussion so again that's really where we try to just reach out through a lot of different mm -hmm. venues and talk with folks that way okay. which hopefully broadens those opportunities rather than restricting them okay thank you thank you um, so I too will thank you for the work and we have a motion and a second on the table all in favor of this calendar and that is unanimous thank you so much at this at this time we'll move to dr. Smith I'm sorry no it's just say the financial report yes I was going to yeah. do that okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. so we'll, while Ms. Diamond comes forward I'll just point out that we are uh, going to talk about our finances through October of 2019 today on December 3rd and in two, two weeks on December 18th we're going to talk about uh, you know budget FY 21 for the 21 2021 school year and so this is an ongoing constant conversation and one of the things that we've done and that I'll be talking more about when I offer the recommended budget is to create a more year-round way of thinking about the budget over the last couple of years and some of the things that we'll be talking about on December 18th we'll actually will begin working on them in January and uh, so I have tried not to miss an opportunity to say in public that as we go forward with this recommended budget and as you take it up and make any changes to it and adjustments that you deem necessary uh, when it goes to the county government on March on or before March 1st it will be a significant ask and I've said that this is probably the seriously 40th or 50th time I've said that in public se sessions since this budget that we're in right now was adopted last end of May and so when we think about our capital budget last week 
of $1.818 billion for the next six years. And then we think about our operating budget. We, we ask for a lot of resources and we get very good results. And Ms. Wolf, I have to say how much I appreciated that you read those statistics today for Springbrook High School. I've been to almost 50 graduations in the past three years as superintendent of schools. I have heard those sorts of, <coughs> of numbers and those sorts of accomplishments by our students over and over and over at every single school. And I just become very frustrated and upset when people say, well, this high school isn't very good or that high school isn't very good. You can get a world-class education at every single high school in this county, which means the elementary and middle schools that feed into it are doing their work. And it's our job to make sure that the barriers, that the expectations, that the disparities are reduced and eliminated. That's our work, so that every single student gets the full benefit of the resources that Ms. Diamond's gonna talk about right now. And so I just wanted to point that out as we look at our financials, because our financials are an ex just one expression of the exemplary work that gets done on behalf of so many students and how we need to continue to ever grow that number of students who experience that very best opportunity. Ms. Diamond? So I can attest for at least 39 of those 40 uh, times Dr. Smith shared <laughs> that our budget will be quite an ask. Um, and we've been working round the clock on making sure we put that budget together uh, to meet the needs of our students. One of the things that we do um, with you as a board and with our community is make sure that we are on a regular basis monitoring the ongoing uh, budget process and ensuring that we're looking at how we spend those dollars. So at any given time as we're creating next year's budget, which Dr. Smith alluded to and getting ready for next year and his presentation of that on the 18th of this month, we're looking at how we're using this year's dollars to meet the needs of our students. And that's important for a lot of reasons. One, um, we want to make sure we're using them well to meet the needs of students. Two, because as we think about how we create and present a budget, Dr. Daca loves when I do this, I know. Uh, we can't present a budget with expenditures unless we talk about where we're getting the funding. And part of the funding um, comes from the state, about a third of our funding. Part of the funding comes from our local government. And a small piece of the funding does come from our fund balance, how much we have in terms of our, our existing budget at the end of the year. And although it's a very small amount, about 1%, $25 million, 1% of two point, we have $2.68 billion. If we didn't have that 1%, that 25 million, it would mean coming back to you as a board and saying, here is the $25 million worth of program, people and work we need to cut because we don't have the funds to cover that amount of expenses. So while it's a small amount of our budget that we fund with the prior year's budget, it does impact um, our program. And so when we monitor our current year's budget, when we talk about savings, when we talk about the fund balance, it's not because we're trying to create savings and give back money. It's because we're trying to assess how much money we will have to fund next year's budget. So in this current year's budget of the $2.68 billion that we, um, we, uh, you approved, uh, at the county council approved for our budget, you'll recall that 25 million of that came from last year's budget. Um, as we look to next year, the superintendent has already shared with you that he's looking to um, have approximately the same amount of money coming from this year's budget. And that can come from the budget as well as what might be in the existing fund balance. And so if you look to page two of the document, you'll see we try to provide you on the top of the page. Not much changed since the last time we were together. It was only about two and a half weeks ago that we were together. Um, we started off this year with $30 million. You know that we moved forward $25 million of that to fund this year's bu uh, budget. It left us $5.4 million. We have $1 million more in revenue. Now, um, you'll recall what happened last year is around mid-year um, with some pushing from Ms. Dixon and others on our fiscal management team, we began looking at 
um, the return we were receiving from our banks. Um, and we began working very hard and um, pushing our banks to look at how much return we were getting in terms of investment. And we changed um, our interactions with our banks. And so our investment return changed late in the year. And so we projected late in the year after our budget was approved, approximately a million dollars more in revenue. That million dollars carried into this year as well. So we have a million dollars more. Our budget had already been approved. You won't see that million dollars when Dr. Smith moves forward next year's budget. But so we have an additional million dollars in revenue than we had originally anticipated when Dr. Smith presented the budget over a year ago. And so when you put all that together, um, what is remaining of the 5.4 million and the million, we actually start off the year with $6.4 million available to support next year's budget as Dr. Smith prepares to present that budget to you. As we look at where we are with each of our um, categories, we're projecting approximately $18.5 million. So when you put that together with the $6 million, we're looking at almost $25 million, which is approximately where we think uh, we will need to be in terms of funding funding the budget for next year. If you look at the attachments, um, they break it down. I'll highlight just a couple of areas for you in the attachments. Um, some areas where we're seeing the biggest uh, changes and the biggest adjustments that we're making and monitoring closely. So first, let me take you to attachment two. In administration, we are not projecting any fund balance. Um, we're very close in administration. It's not a very large budget. That's the super, what we call the office of the superintendent. It's administration. It's mostly central office. It's HR. It's technology. Um, it's finance. It's the operations of the executive part of the organization. And so you don't see a lot of funds in there to start, but we, we, we operate pretty close to the edges there, um, and we're not projecting much of a surplus there at all. If you look at mid-level administration, right now we're projecting about one, uh, one million dollars out of the uh, original about 155 million dollars, so less than one percent. Category three, which sits at about a billion dollars, we're projecting approximately 13 million dollars um, surplus there. That's where we usually um, find most of our surplus. It is a healthy, and he when I say healthy, I don't mean healthy as in large. If you think about an overall budget of a billion dollars, um, $13 million is a, is a small increment of that, and it's healthy because if we fluctuate in terms of our overall salaries and our teacher salaries and paraeducator salaries, even a slight amount, that $13 million very quickly um, goes down to zero. And so we have, um, we budget very close to the cuff there, um, and so we feel very comfortable with our $13 million sitting in that amount. In category four, which is where our curriculum sits, you're not seeing any changes um, in terms of surplus. That's because we have all of our new <coughs> curriculum materials. In category five, which is our other instructional costs, which are equipment, again, um, we're sitting very close to our budget there. We're making sure schools have all the instructional materials as well as equipment they need um, and instructional costs. and. Um, Things like chemical uh, waste removal sit in that account, uh, equipment replacement, uh, musical instruments, all of those sit in those accounts. Category six is special education. Uh, we have over $329 million, almost $330 million in special education, and we're seeing approximately a million dollars in that account, so we're talking about less than a third of a percent there. Um, category seven, again, we're sitting pretty close to our overall budget as well as eight. Transportation, category nine, approximately a million, um, $100 million. Uh, we believe we'll be at about 1% surplus there, about a million dollars. That depends on how the year plays out, whether we have to have extra days at the end of the year, um, whether we need additional substitutes, um, and how the snow removal turns out, because we do use our bus drivers, um, and, and how we need overtime in terms of those sorts of uh, days, in terms of getting our bus drivers there on those snow days. But we're, we're anticipating approximately a million dollars there. That is also impacted quite a bit by fuel costs and the weather in the winter time. And so we watch those dollars very closely in January and February, and give you a much more accurate number in January and February, because you know the fluctuation and fuel costs impact that area quite a bit. In category 10, um, 
We have about $145 million there. That's plant and equipment. Again, the wintertime impacts us quite a bit there. Um, our construction costs and other costs, that's not our capital budget, but that, um, that's all of our operations of the plant. We anticipate about a million dollars there, less than 1% of the budget again. Um, and over time and what happens during the winter months also impacts us a lot there. And maintenance of plant category 11 uh, with $40 million, $43 million, we are anticipating approximately $500,000. Um, our fixed charges, with, which is all of our pension and our uh, benefits, so that's our health benefits. So over almost 600 million, 585 million, we're anticipating about a million. Most of that sits in uh, our FICA, um, and that depend and that is accounted for by calculations and where we have vacancies at the beginning of the year versus the end of the year. Um, that number could go down over the next couple of months because of um, positions that have been filled since the beginning of the year, but we anticipate there'll be approximately a million dollars there. So overall, you can see approximately $18.5 million. Um, we'll continue to keep you updated, and you'll see this number reflected in the superintendent's budget at the end of the month. Okay. Well, Ms. Dixon. I just want to say thank you, Nikki, for the extra million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for pushing okay. us. All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing that information. Um, and I see no lights, which means we have no questions, right? So at this time, we will go on to the next item on the agenda, which is consent items. I'm going to um, ask for a, a motion to move in block if there are not items that board members wish to pull. Move in block. Is there a second? Second. To move it and second it. All in favor? And that is unanimous. So at this time, we will come to the next item on the agenda, item 11, discussing secondary grading and reporting. Dr. Smith? Mm -hmm. So I think I have a slide that's going to come up. Um, so one of the most important things that we work on is around student grading and reporting and how we identify. And it can have tremendous impact on students um, in terms of their sense of efficacy, the degree to which they believe they can accomplish what is set before them. And so as we look at this report today, I would just like to challenge all of us, the entire staff across the system, uh, the board members, myself especially, and our community to understand that when we talk about grading and reporting, we're really talking about three aspects of this effort. Um, and those three aspects are the mechanisms for students to move through the school system, performance, student performance at any given moment or over a period of time, and most important, learning. And what students learn and what they carry with them. I think this is particularly important when you look here at what was happening with high school completion over time. And we know we're up in the mid-80s uh, now, 80 85% or so nationally that that has changed considerably over time. High school completion. The mechanisms of moving through are promotion, course taking, and credits. So you're promoted from second to third grade. You take certain courses that are required in middle school. You don't earn credits, but you take required courses. And then in high school, you take required and elective courses, and you earn or don't earn credits. Those are mechanisms. They don't indicate the degree to which a student has learned something. We also assign grades. We look at students' assessment scores. We look at projects and tasks and all sorts of different kinds of work. That's performance. That's not durable learning. The learning that we carry with us out of fourth grade, out of seventh grade, out of 12th grade, into college, into the workplace, into life. That's the learning. And anytime we get those out of balance or we get confused about the value of each one and what it tells us, then we create systems that don't serve students well. I point this out because when many of the current practices like transcripts 
like semester grades, like the Carnegie unit, which was based on um, 90, or actually 60 hours of student work is the original Carnegie unit, which is how we wound up with 90 day semesters and 45 minute classes. It really is, it's how it all, it all happened at the turn of the previous century, the late 1800s, early 1900s. All this was established and we have built off of this. None of it was built, however, with the belief system and this phrase gets misused and thrown around a lot. So I'll just say what I mean when I say it. And since I coined it, I know what I mean. All means all. None of these systems were built with all means all in mind. Because as you can see here, look what was happening in 1950. By 1960, you were hitting up in the, the 50%. And 1991, we were up in the high 70s for some groups of students, some populations, not so much for others. We saw a little bit of of decrease in the disparity that exists. They weren't built for all means all. They weren't built for every student to go to school, be well taken care of, and have success. They were built for the students who stayed in school. And as a way to sort kids who stayed in school as headed for college, headed for technical training, or headed for what was called in 1946 life adjustment. We've got to pay attention to this as we do our work. Here we see real disparities. And if you look here at completing four years of college, what happens? In 1950, college was for a very select group of people in this country, predominantly white males, as you can see. By 1970, that hadn't changed tremendously. By 1980, it hadn't changed. By 1991, it hadn't changed. These are not my opinions, it's just facts. So we as a staff have spent a lot of time talking about this. We've spent a lot of time pushing on one another. A lot of the staff has spent a lot of time working across the system. We've had extensive conversations, as you heard from the public comment earlier, uh, around the grading templates, we need to be really thoughtful as we continue to evolve these systems. So they truly support high levels of excellence and ever increasing equity for all students. Because when I say all means all, I mean you can read at or above grade level. You have full access to any mathematics program that we offer. You can enter any STEM or arts program. You can participate in world languages. You get the best possible care and well-being in every school around your mental health, your physical, social, and psychological well-being. That's what I mean by all means all. People use it about the budget, they use it about facilities, they use it about transportation. Learning is at our core, and this is so embedded in learning, and we, some of the things we have to actually unlearn that we've believed about grading as people my age. I have to have had to unlearn some of my beliefs about how grading works. So I wanna commend the people in front of you. They've worked very hard to do this and are bringing forth the first set of work. There are many more sets to come and it's my belief this work never ends because as soon as we think we've got it right, we better be checking to see what's changed in the society and what's changed for kids. So Dr. McKnight, I'll turn it over to you and you can walk the group through. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um, and as we begin the conversation, Dr. Smith so eloquently kind of shared an overview of what this looks like for our students who extend into college. Um, I always live the uh, early elementary side. I reflect on last night uh, when I got home, I had to um, have a conversation with my seven-year-old <laughs> about um, what a rubric meant, just from the question of how did you perform on your Native American uh, tribe project? And he says, oh, I got a piece of paper. It wasn't a grade, but we should talk about what that paper means. <laughs> and so we got the paper, it was a rubric. But it, you know, it was so interesting to go through that process with him of uh, just kind of really thinking through every component of a project and what that meant. And most importantly, as I think about him and I reflect on what grades mean for all of our students, mm -hmm. it says something to them loud and clear about their level of performance and ultimately what they believe they are capable of doing. And much of the work that we have to do for students oftentimes come to, one, their core belief in themselves and what they believe that they can do. 
And so as we look at years of disparity um, amongst different groups, we have to continue to say, well, how do we continue to look at our practices to make sure we instill that? So with that said, in my nice lesson last night with my uh, seven-year-old, <laughs> I'll go back to um, just really emphasizing that grading and reporting is one of the most complex topics in public education. Um, and especially in our high school and secondary level, knowing that grades become very meaningful for people next steps in their college or career, whatever that may be. Um, grades are high stakes and also reflect the ultimate professional judgment of classroom teachers. Now, as I think about the complexity of it, I'll say there are several things that we try to balance as we think about this. We want to reflect on what students know and can apply in some meaningful way. That's what a grade should reflect. And then we also want to balance that with consistency that support equitable outcomes for all students. And while doing that, we also want to make sure we are supporting our teachers and them being very knowledgeable of what our students' learning currently is and the progression of that learning. And so as you think about those three things, <laughs> I just say that to say this is what makes the process very complex because you want to balance all of those things together and come up with the best system to be able to do that. So with that said, today we're going to delve more deeply into these topics and make recommendations for the implementation in the 2020-21 school year. Montgomery County Public Schools formed a multi-stakeholder secondary grading and reporting work group in spring of 2019. Today you're going to hear an update on the work from that particular work group. There are also more immediate changes underway in the 1920 school year driven by recently revised COMAR regulations that include new requirements for grading and reporting procedures, grade changes, and annual audits. For today's conversation, we will start with reviewing some of MCPS's history of grading and reporting, explain the changes that are in effect for this school year, and then discuss the longer term work of the secondary grading and reporting work group. We also will discuss other connected topics such as final exams and semester grades before taking questions and having more discussion. And it was my pleasure to sit in the other day with this work group because they have really worked tireless at um, looking at what all of the options are and most importantly, engaging a robust group of people in this conversation to make sure we're looking at all options. And so with that, I'll say at the table today, we have Ms. Nikki Hazel, who is the Associate Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction Programs. We have Ms. Jennifer Webster here as a Director in the Office of School Support and Improvement. Mrs. Serenity Moore, who's a consulting teacher co-lead and also the co-lead of the Secondary Grade and Reporting work group, Mr. Scott Murphy. So with that, Dr. McKnight, yes. I wanted to make an announcement. I was waiting for someone to come in here and then I just noticed she was here because I couldn't see her before. Oh. And that's <laughs> Donna Blaney. So to start this presentation off today, I'd like to announce that the same group of people along with our OSA colleagues up there, the three our three colleagues mm -hmm. sitting up there, our uh, school support and improvement colleagues, our curriculum colleagues in front of you, as well as folks from special ed, family student uh, engagement, family student services, mm -hmm. and OCTO, many, many different organizations, but especially a thank you to Donna Blaney, Janet Wilson, and all of the people out of OSA. Yes. And Carrie, yes, because we went through a very rigorous audit that the State Board of Education has required for all public school systems in Maryland to make sure that graduation had integrity and that we were following the state rules and laws. And we got our report back right before the Thanksgiving holiday week. And the school system was awarded after this audit uh, 98 out of 100 points or a 98% compliance, effectiveness, and best practices recognition. So we'll be sending this to the board, but I just really want to thank our high school principals, our high school registrars, mm -hmm. our high school teachers, and the central office people sitting in right here, all of these people for their good work. And I didn't want to make the announcement without Ms. Blaney here because she was central to the effort and I couldn't see her. So. Thank you so much. Yes, all of you. Thank you very much. All right. Ms. Hazel. All right. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Um, before I turn it over to the team, I want to start by just sharing um, a little bit of the complex history of grading and reporting in MCPS going back about 20 years. A few highlights of that history include the first district-wide exams that were administered in the year 2000, 
which brought about significant changes for, uh, to grading and reporting that took place over the next several years. And in 2006, policies were finalized that brought about the first standardized procedures, such as how homework would count, the elimination of extra credit, and implementation of what is known as the 50% rule, which we will explain a little later in the presentation. Shortly after that, for the first time, MCPS had the first district-wide electronic gradebook, which was used for throughout all of our schools and brought about more standardized grading practices across MCPS. And meanwhile, there uh, continue to be conversations about how school attendance should factor into a student's grade. In those years, MCPS implemented what was known as the loss of credit policy, in which students could fail a class with five unexcused absences, even with a passing grade. And because of disparities in how the practice was used by teachers and schools, the loss of credit practice was eliminated in 2010 and replaced with an attendance intervention process that focused more on addressing the root causes of absenteeism as opposed to punitive approaches. The last decade has brought about continued evolution of the PARC tests uh, and our transition to quarterly assessments in place of final exams in 2016, which also brought about a new method of calculating semester grades. And over the last few years, we have fully operationalized the use of multiple measures to assess whether students are learning the implemented evidence of learning framework. Most recently, earlier this year, new Comar regulations that govern grading and reporting were adopted, which are uh, driving immediate changes to grading and reporting that are in effect this school year. So as you can see, it's important to keep this history in mind while we discuss grading and reporting and consider improvements to current systems. For today's discussion, it's important to remember that there are no perfect grading systems. As we look at grading across the country, there are different grading systems in place, and they all do have their flaws. Colleges tell us that there are no per preferred methods of grading, since most colleges do their own analysis of transcripts and recalculate student grade point averages. For us, this is a great opportunity, not only to respond to new regulations, but also to take long-term approaches to ensure equity in our grading practices by shifting from consistency within schools to consistency across schools. For today's conversation, the team will discuss both the short-term and long-term implications and address many of these issues. So I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer Webster, who will share more important information about the recent Comar changes and the new practices for effective this school year. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mrs. Hazel. And as Mrs. Hazel shared, and Dr. McKnight also referenced, there are some short-term changes that we were required to make because the Maryland State Department of Education <coughs> issued changes that impacted local grading and reporting policies. We were required to implement changes specifically um, around the three areas um, that you see on the screen. These needed to go into effect by October 1st of 2019. And the changes centered around um, a grade change, what they also call grade modifications that needed to be made within 45 school days. Also, uh, the use of regular grade change audits and the inclusion in our regulations about how attendance factors into a grade. So in response to those MSDE or Maryland State Department of Education requirements, uh, we worked to collaborate with our high school principals uh, to really create and operationalize the refinements that would bring us in alignment with those regulations. We discussed the proposed changes with stakeholder groups, including the councils on teaching and learning and our representatives in the MCC PTA. We updated our grading and reporting regulation, IKA, RA to reflect the Maryland State Department of Education requirements for clear documentation of grade change procedures and that timeline of 45 school days at the end of a marking period to make changes. We also established a process for uh, regular local auditing of our grade change processes. We clarify the criteria and procedures for conducting credit recovery courses in high school, including initiating a process for training all credit recovery coordinators. 
and we updated JEARA student attendance to reflect the use of attendance intervention plans in high schools to address absenteeism. <coughs> One area of clarification for schools based on these changes is the difference between a grade change and retaking a course. So grade changes and grade modifications are done within 45 school days after the end of a marking period and typically are the result of things like gradebook errors, incompletes, missing assignments. When students retake a course or a portion of a course, as in the case with credit recovery, this is not a grade change, but falls under a different, already established process called mark exclusion. Thus, our students have longer than 45 school days to retake a course or a portion of a course. And credit recovery is one of the ways that students can have a grade replaced, and I wanna go a little bit deeper into the credit recovery process with you. Students retake a course for a variety of reasons, and the circumstances surrounding credit recovery, which is, again, retaking a portion of a course, is different than when students retake a full course. So I want to orient you to those circumstances surrounding credit recovery for our students. To look at when students retake a portion of a course with credit recovery, we need to look at the semester grade calculation table. It's also worth noting, as Dr. Smith alluded to in his opening comments, that grade, the grade table uh, the grades do not always reflect accurately reflect learning. Students may actually know more or less than what their grades reveal. But grades are, however, part of the mechanism for awarding credit toward graduation. There are times when our students are working toward just that, the credit, or in this case, a D. Our students engaged in credit recovery are in a situation where they're trying to meet our graduation requirement, specifically passing a particular class. Credit recovery applies when students fall into the DE scenario that you see in the red box on the grade calculation table. And as you can see, a student earning DE earns an E for the semester. So we have defined credit recovery as the student is retaking the content from the second or fourth marking period because these are the marking periods that the student has failed in this scenario. The credit recovery experience, once completed, results in the student earning a D, which moves them up if you look at the, now there's a second red box, that shows that then their grade calculation would be a D for the semester. I also want to share that our high schools are using common, centrally created, and mostly online resources for credit recovery, or they're getting their materials approved by the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs. So now I want to shift into the topic of attendance and how attendance impacts or can impact student grades. <coughs> Our current attendance policy, as Ms. Hazel noted, emphasizes intervention. School teams use attendance intervention plans to document the steps that they take to improve student attendance. If, however, the schools have implemented an attendance intervention plan in support of a student and the student's attendance does not improve, the student does earn an E3, which is essentially an E as a result of attendance, and they're expected to repeat the course. In most cases, the students in these scenarios were already earning an E from missing so much of the course. However, there are cases where our students did earn a passing grade despite having a large number of absences. And in those cases, schools are required to give those students the opportunity to restore their passing grade. Now, as we've discussed attendance with our high school principals, we, have, uh, we are keeping our eye on a proposed regulation that is out for public comment from the Maryland State Department of Education. And that proposed regulation would deny credit to any student who has 5% or more unexcused absences in a course. So at this point, I'm gonna hand the presentation over to Ms. Moore. Thank you. Again, I'm Serenity Moore, and I am co-facilitating this work group with Mr. Murphy. I will be speaking to you about the long-term expectations of the grading and reporting work group. Um, since May, we've been meeting to refine our charge and to hear from a wide range of stakeholders. Currently, we have over 40 members in our work group that include the following demographics. Teachers, administrators, students, central office members, instructional specialists, and CTL members, which represent the Council for Teaching and Learning. In fact, when we heard from teachers that teachers wanted more teacher representatives, we responded to their call. We invited and included more teachers to engage in this important work. The work we are doing is complex. What you see is our charge. 
We will be recommending electronic gradebook templates that will coincide with the new student information system. We will develop explicit guide guidance for implementation of the 50% rule to ensure there is consistency across our district with regards to implementation. We will examine semester grade calculation and we will examine how attendance factors into a grade. What you see is a quote that represents the current state of our gradebook in our district. Grade level or course teams or departments must establish consistent grading processes. What this means is that decisions about gradebook templates are made at the PLC level at each school. A PLC can be an eighth grade science team in a middle school or an algebra two team in a high school. The teachers who are members of the PLC would work together at the start of the school year to determine the grading template at the school level. This practice is in alignment with the current board policy. Templates are made up of categories, and categories can consist of many different groupings, things such as tests, quizzes, labs, homework, etc. Our current grading system presents opportunities for inequities. MCPS has a focus on equity and access for all, and addressing grading templates is one way our district can elevate our system's initiatives. These numbers represent data that indicates that our students are not having similar grading and reporting experiences. If you focus on the blue circle, this data point is communicating that we have a school that has as many as 51 different gradebook categories. If you move to the second green circle, across our district, we have over 200 gradebook categories. And finally, the number 80 is representing that we have a range in our category of weights that can increase as much as 80%. What that means is that a formative category in school A may be worth 25% in a school, but that same formative category in school B could be worth 65%. Now let's take a look at what these inequities can look like from the lens of students and families. These represent actual grading templates that are currently in use. Although this is the same course, students who are enrolled in this course may have four different grading templates. Please remember from a couple of slides ago that categories represent things like quizzes, tests, homework, labs, etc. Let's take a moment to focus on the top row, which represents Algebra 1 in two middle schools in our district. Middle School A has two categories which can be found on the left side of the column representing two categories, 90%, all task assessments, 10% MCPS progress checks. The second school, which is middle school B, has four categories in their template. Now, if you'll focus on the second row, which is high school, same course, in high school A, there are four different categories. In high school B, there are also four categories. But if you compare and contrast, those categories are different across those templates. This wide variance does not allow for equity for all students. Now let's drill down to personalize how, grading, how a grading template inconsistencies can present inequities for a student in our system. These two grades represent the work of one student in our system if applied in two different ways. If a student is in the same course, has the same assignments, same grades, if they are in school A that has gradebook template A, they would earn a C. However, that same work with the same grades would garner a different outcome if in school B with gradebook template B, where they would earn a letter grade of a B for the course. As you can see, our current process yields inequities for our students. Our work group will continue to address these concerns directly and strategically. Our work group has already spoken very clearly that the recommendation is to move from consistency within schools to consistency across schools. As we just demonstrated, this is an issue of equity that can be addressed by ensuring that the same courses have the same grading templates district-wide. We will be ready for implementation by the 2020-2021 school year. This work group has elevated the crucial importance of professional development. 
This professional development around grading templates would need to be annual to ensure there is increase in consistent equity in our students' experiences. Mrs. Moore, can we pause for just one moment? Sure. Mrs. Madraski had a question. I'm quickly. sorry, if you could just go back to the last slide. I just could you explain that to me again? How how this is sure. how something like that happens? Sure. So because students are enrolled in courses mm -hmm. and um, we don't have or we have inconsistent grading templates, mm -hmm. if a school or if a student is in a course and receives the same assignments from a teacher and earns the same grades from that teacher. If that student is situated under template A, the grade calculation would produce a C, which is that 77%. However, that student who receives the same assignments and earns the same grades under a different template, for example, template, grade, uh, template gradebook B, mm -hmm. then that student would earn a B for the same work for the that's same assignments and for earning strictly the same because grades. of the per amount of percentage that's right. assigned to each right. thing. Correct. Yes. Like category Correct. Weight. The it's because the template is inconsistent. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You can continue. Thank you. No <laughs> <laughs> no Thank you. Mm -hmm. So as um, Ms. Moore stated, this initial phase of moving to greater consistency of the electronic gradebook templates has been the first phase, and uh, we are wrapping up that first phase with the work group and we'll be ready for implementation next school year. But moving forward um, and uh, to the next phase, there are other complex topics, <clears throat> excuse me, that relate to grading and reporting that are also within our charge in this work group and will be addressed in the coming year. For example, there continues to be interest in looking at our letter grade system, which has been used in MCPS for decades. This A, B, C, D, E method of calculating semester grade in the table you saw earlier uses an average of two letter grades to get the final semester grade. The final letter grade is then on the student's report card. When we look across the country and other school districts and also at the college level, there are a wide range of ways to calculate semester grades. Many use letter grades like we do, Others put actual percentages on report cards. So the report card might say 88% or an 82% and then take an average. Others may use a plus or minus system where the 88 is reported <coughs> as a B plus or the 82 is reported as a B minus. There are also other approaches that others take like a four point grading scale where grades are measured on a zero, one, two, three, four. So given the complexity of these options and many different points of view, this will be discussed in depth in the work group and will take some time. Any, recommend, any recommended changes would come forward for discussion in 2020 and would need further vetting, study, and analysis before implementing changes. There are also additional topics within the scope of the work group, um, such as the 50% rule and how we implement reassessment that will also be part of this next phase. These topics do need careful deliberation and will be on a rolling timeline with new guidance, communication, wide communication, and professional development for next school year. But other topics such as changing the way that we calculate a semester grade would need more time and take place beyond next school year. Before we close the presentation, I do want to mention just a couple of additional topics that tend to get the most attention in this conversation. One is the implementation of what is known as the 50% rule. This practice was put in place over a decade ago as a mechanism to ensure that earning a very low score on one assessment would not overly weight the impact on the overall final grade. For example, if a student takes a test and for whatever reason only gets 40% correct, the 50% rule states that a 50% is the lowest grade that would be entered in the grade book. This is applied because in a 100 point system, the range of failing grades is from zero to 59, while the other grades are in increments of 10. As a result, when a student earns below a 50, it mathematically skews the grade downward and is nearly impossible for a student to recover from. Compare that to a four point grading system, when the difference between zero and one, or D and E, is the same range as the other letter grades. In this example, the increment between each letter grade is the same, one point. This is the math behind the 50% rule, which tries to ensure a proportionate way of calculating the grades if, when a low grade on a single assessment occurs. But more importantly, by ensuring that students have an opportunity to recover from a bad day or a low score on a single test, we're also sending an important message to students Research tells us that when students experience failure, they tend to withdraw, not try as hard, come to school less, 
and feel that they do not belong. So when we look at grading and reporting practices, we need to ensure that we have strategies to keep students in the game for the entire marking period or semester, even after experiencing failure initially or having a bad day. Another ongoing interest we hear from the community is about final exams, which often comes up in the grading and reporting conversation. It's important to note that there are constantly changing conditions outside of MCPS about testing and assessment. For example, two years ago, the More Learning Less Testing Act capped mandated testing at 2.2% of all instructional time, meaning the previous practice of administering two-hour exams twice a year in five or six subject areas would far exceed this limit. In terms of required district-wide assessment, we now use quarterly assessments as one of multiple measures to, to know whether students are progressing during the year, not just at the end. This isn't to say that a, that a final exam isn't a good way to measure what students learned or prepare them for college. It can be. In fact, many teachers still give their own exams during the regular school schedule. We also know that there continue to be shifts at the college level. Many colleges and universities give final exams at the end of the semester, the way that many of us experience them in college. However, when we survey the literature on this topic, it's clear that higher ed is also questioning the role of final exams at the college level, and there is a shift towards more project-based approaches or alternatives to multiple choice tests. Research has also shown that there's a correlation between the size of a college class and the final exam format. So large lecture hall classes tend to give more long multiple choice exams that measure cumulative knowledge, whereas smaller college classes lend themselves more to projects, research, presentations, extended essays as culminating assessments. Lastly, as we discuss exams, we need to keep in mind the historical data that we have from the past to inform any decisions we make in the future. So for example, let's take a look at the last year that final exams were fully implemented in MCPS, the 2014-15 school year. This example shows all mathematics exams that were administered in 2014-15. In those years, the final exam counted for 25% of the overall semester grade. Classes were stopped for a week each semester in order to administer the two-hour exams. If students did not need to take an exam, they typically were not in school. Another lens we now have is our student focus groups identified in the equity accountability model. We did not monitor these focus groups in this way during those years. However, if we take a look at the exam results with that lens, there are interesting patterns that emerge when we analyze the impact across different student groups. Although the exam counted for 25% of the final grade, what this chart shows is that for the vast majority, upwards of 75 to 80% of students, the final exam had no impact on the semester grade. In fact, for those of us familiar with the final exam experience in high school during those years, that was the experience. Some students put in concerted effort to prepare for and take the exam. For many other students, however, they knew the exam would have no bearing on the final grade. However, among students for whom it did matter, for students in which the final exam lowered the grade, it disproportionately impacted students in poverty the most, almost double that of other groups. And for students whom the final exam raised their grade, it advantaged white and Asian students not in poverty the most. This is not to say that the conversation about exams isn't an important one, and we certainly need to make sure that we are preparing students for the college experience. However, we, when making decisions about exams or other decisions that factor in how much something should count in a student's grade, we must ensure that we are not unintentionally advantaging some students and disadvantaging others. Can I ask a question about that? Yep. What do you attribute that these um, numbers? Not is it. Was the final exam not weighted very much, and that's why it didn't have an impact on the final grade? And I'd be happy to answer that question. So I was in a meeting the weekend before Thanksgiving week where I sat on Friday night, all day Saturday, and a good part of Sunday having this very conversation with people from across the country. Uh, and it was fascinating. And what it comes down to is that final exams were structured. The very structure was for that graphic I showed you at the beginning. For kids who were staying in high school and then especially for students who were going on to college. 
those are the students who actually understand best how to navigate the school world. And they're almost, they're heavily weighted toward cramming. And so you not only are in the course and you are heavily weighted toward knowing how to navigate school, what's important, what's not. You have really strong, broad knowledge because you've grown up in an environment where there's lots of print, where there's lots of experience, where there's lots of language. And then you figure out pretty quickly. The human brain figures out patterns and anomalies. So you figure out the patterns of how to take these sorts of tests. So when we look at this, what we see are students who have that experience, those experience I was describing, it's often called privilege or well-resourced or middle and upper class families that have a college going tradition in their family do profoundly better than students who don't have those same structures. And I am really pleased to report that all of the research I heard, the research I heard earlier I was describing about social risk and mm -hmm. risk-taking behaviors, heard that at this conference along with this, that finally people are starting to pay attention to the neuroscience, which says really four things need to happen for the best learning. And many, many, many of our teachers have been doing this for decades because they see it and understand it uh, in their practice. And, but now the researchers are saying it. And I have a book I'll be happy to give you. I read five years ago, and now it is sweeping the, the practitioner level. It's called Make It Stick, or Made to Stick. And what it says is that first you use retrieval practice. Use lots of smaller self-assessments and in-class assessments. So you're constantly having kids test themselves so that they check to see what they know and what they don't know, and then they build off of that. The second is spacing. Spacing is about making sure that retrieval practice happens on a regular basis throughout the, the course. The third area is called interleaving. For decades, we've believed around learning that if we just chunk or block, as it's called in the research, all of the like information. So I'm going to teach, I'm going to teach the uh, linking verbs. So I'm going to just teach nothing but linking verbs for three weeks in my English class, and then I'm going to test kids once on those, and then I'll know if they know them. And then I check a month later, they don't know any of the linking verbs. They learned them for the test, or they never learned them for the test. It's just what it is. If we interleave, which is to say, I'm going to teach you linking verbs, I'm going to teach you action verbs, and I'm going to teach you adverbs at the same time because they're often confused for verbs. And then I'm going to interleave those, or another word is interweave them. And as you assess yourself and do your retrieval practice, and as I teach, I'm not going to say to you, well, these are just linking verbs. Because you know what? When you walk out of this class and have to write well in the future, you need to know that in your own head. The, the phrase durable learning comes from this book I'm referencing. The, the author of the book that I read five years ago was actually at this conference speaking about this as were virtually every other author. In fact, David Rose spoke there, the originator of the Universal Design for Learning Systems, and he talked about these very things. He says, this is what I've been saying about Universal Design for Learning for years, and now all of a sudden, because neuroscience is saying it this way, it's getting attention. So it really has to do with what's my experience as a young child, as an elementary child, as a middle school student? What's my experience with family or social structures that know how to navigate school and teach me about these structures? What's my experience with having both the will and the understanding and the infrastructure in my life to allow for cramming? You don't cram in some families. There's not the space for it. In other families, there's lots of space for cramming. My kids had lots of space for cramming the night before a test. <laughs> and yet, if I had known then what I know now, I would have said, no, put the books away. If you haven't learned it by now, learning it overnight and then forgetting it day after tomorrow is a waste of your time. That's what I would have taught them if I had read this book before they were all grown and out of college. It's a fundamental change in the way we teach and an under a much deeper, better understanding of the way human beings learn. I, I 
could have paid you a lot of money to ask that question because this is what we've got to be obsessed with in the coming years in Montgomery County. How do we help every single student from that first day of universal pre-K through the 12th grade learn and then we show accurate performance and we help them understand the mechanisms that allow you to go through life. And there's a lot of concern that, well, students won't know how to go to college. We have almost a thousand students in dual enrollment across the street at, and at the three campuses. We have the largest advanced placement and IB participation in uh, essentially the nation when you look relative to the number of students. We have many teachers who give final exams and I'm fine with that. But to say a student's transcript ought to be, in whatever the old way of thinking about final exams, ought to be a representation of that, I would tell you adamantly and strongly and passionately, we should not do that. This is enough evidence for me that it is, we need to keep working on this idea of assessment without a doubt, and we never need to stop, but we cannot go backwards towards something that produces these results. Unless we're willing to say, that white and Asian students who are not in poverty are just inherently smarter than other kids, and I don't accept that. I don't accept it. I do not accept that for our kids in this school system. And that's why all of the research, all of the study that's going on right now says this happens. I listened to one speaker from a very prominent college in Boston that said, I use nothing now but retrieval practice spacing and interleaving and and those four and the the final those three and the final one is about the the experiences we create for kids in our classes to help them through those three believe they have the skill the understanding the knowledge to do well because then it goes to the 50 percent rule i got a 23 percent on a major test i'm done I'm done. I have no confidence I can recover. I'll get an F or an E for this term. That's the fourth one, is building student efficacy and confidence using very different practices than we've ever used before in a widespread way. And I hope our friends at the higher education level are listening to, and I was in the room with 1,200 of them, many of them from higher ed, really paying attention for two and a half days. And it's, I think it's, it's, it's fundamental to the change we want to see in our school system and in our levels of learning. Ms. Sylvester. I have more questions, but I'll wait for the discussion. Okay. I'm sorry, it was a long answer, but it's a big question. Ms. Wolf. Uh, I have a question. Now, I heard what you said, and of course, I'm not an educator, so I'm relying on you. But when I look at this data, what I see, if it's a math exam, I agree with you. But if it's something, say, history or English where you might be writing out essays, what I see is bias, possible bias. Oh, without a this. doubt, yes. And, and that would result in why certain groups are getting lower scores. But that bias has three entry points. There's bias even to get into the class where you learn the writing skills mm -hmm. that you need. Right. There's bias about my belief systems about you depending, as your teacher, I'm the teacher, and what you can do and what I help you achieve during that term. And then there's also the bias about how we illustrate the performance. There's so many points where my own belief systems can either support a student or can be a real barrier to that student's progress. It's not one place, it's multiple places. Thank you. I should really go in the other room. I get so no, excited. No. <laughs> excited. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to uh, go back to what you said about linking verbs. Uh, I taught language, as most of you know, but a star and ser are to be in the Spanish language, but the adjectives are either temporary or permanent. You can correct me on that, but <laughs> we have to we have to do it all the time. It's not just that you present it and then you move on to the next thing. It has to be uh, reiterated, mm -hmm. and we have to look at where our students are, regroup if they need it, reteach if they yep. need it, and that's a skillful teacher. And sometimes I don't think we're doing that with the students that are in the gray area, getting the 70s and 74s, and we, we have to turn that around because they have the possibility of, of getting this, but they may, need, uh, they may need some special ed activities. I, I look at special ed teachers because they do all kinds mm -hmm. of 
um, different techniques to, to get students to learn. Okay, so we're almost done. We'll let them complete and then we'll go to our discussion. You sure, can I'll, I'll wrap it up quickly. Okay. Um, let me just kind of begin to wrap up by saying that one of the most important things that we've learned through the grading and reporting work group, particularly as we start looking ahead to next school year, is the importance of intense communication in multiple ways and training for our teachers and leaders that continues from year to year. So we approach next school year, we're gonna need to have broad communications for the community, as well as training for middle high school teachers, their leaders and leadership teams. Our goal is to make sure that any new grading practices are well understood, easily comprehensible to parents and students, and applied equitably across our schools. So just to summarize, um, as we discussed, there are immediate next steps that are underway right now. Um, such as the new procedures for grade changes that were discussed, credit recovery processes, and now working on the electronic gradebook templates that will be ready for next school year. I do want to, when we're talking about gradebook templates, I do want to acknowledge the, the testimony from earlier about teacher autonomy. Um, the work group, I think, is squarely on the same page with what was uh, commented on earlier as it relates to the professional judgment of teachers, the teacher's level of expertise, as being the most important thing in meeting student needs. We aim certainly for greater equity across our schools based on the variability in the data that you saw earlier, but this is not to say that every grade book will look exactly the same or have the exact same numbers of assignments in a marking period. Teachers are the best decision makers in meeting their students' needs, which is why this also cannot be overly rigid. So I think the work group is, is unanimous in the belief that we can achieve both of these, which is greater equity across our schools while also having the flexibility and professional judgment that we rely, our, rely our, on our teachers for every single day. A little bit longer term, next the work group's gonna take on the 50% rule reassessment um, and have some new guidance out for next school year. Um, and then longer term, uh, we're gonna come back to you in 2020 with continued conversation about curriculum assessments, final exams, semester grade calculations, which again, take takes more time to study, and we need to hear from lots of voices. And as I said earlier, the importance of robust communication and training will be really, really important. I think when we did this uh, over a decade ago, the first time we had a grade, uh, electronic grade book, we did a lot of communication and a lot of training when it all changed, but didn't continue it um, at scale over time. And that was an important lesson learned from the past that will be different as we go forward. So we hope this was helpful in understanding the complex history, the current state, changes that are underway, both short-term and long-term, and what can be a really, really complex topic. So that concludes the presentation. Thank you, thank you. This was great. I'm gonna start to my left with Ms. Dixon, and we'll go around the table. Um, thank you. Could you just share with us a little bit about, you know, one of these work group sessions? What, the, what does that look like? I mean, you have a list of folks who are on this work group. Do they all come every time you meet? How often do you meet? Um, you know, why? I guess my question is, yeah, so let's just start there. And then I'll. Um, again, we began this work in May, mm -hmm. and um, we have been meeting more frequently, uh, or at the beginning par portion, we met more frequently. Part of uh, our core work was to ensure that we created a safe space where people could voice their concerns mm -hmm. and voice their needs and voice what their opinions were. Um, and we were deliberate and intentional in ensuring that we created that <coughs> space for all of the members. We have over 40 members. Sometimes they all can't attend because they are doing different <coughs> things across the system to support students. But we have a consistent group of people who are active participants. Um, we put structures in place to ensure that every voice is heard. We ensure that we collect data anecdotally, and then in addition to that, we have some mechanism or structure for at every meeting where we are collecting their individual um, feedback and concerns about not just the process that we went through to collect data, but their thoughts on the ideas that we were uh, that are being presented or raised by their their members or their colleagues <coughs> in the group. Um, in addition to that, we take that feedback, and that is what we use deliberately to plan out the next uh, work group session. So there's a constant loop of what it is that they need for them to be able to do the work with integrity, and then outside of that, we plan it to make sure that it is responsive to what they've shared with us. All right. so is that meeting 
like once a month, uh, once every other week, or how how yeah, often is that? It's it's twice a month for two hours okay. right now, okay. and we'll continue that way for for foreseeable future. I also want to want to thank um, <laughs> some of our teachers in particular. Mm -hmm. um, there was some feedback um, f that we got from one of the feedback sheets that mm -hmm. we needed to make sure that there were teachers in every single content area represented. Mm -hmm. So grading in fine arts may be different than math, may be right. different than PE, and the list goes on. And you know, a, a work group like this, it was, it was hard to have that, to have every single content area there. But through our, our colleagues at MCEA and the Councils on Teaching and Learning in particular, they've helped us reach every single content area and bring additional people in. Uh, so it's kind of nimble in the fact that we want to make sure that all voices are heard. Um, so I really want to acknowledge the work of these people who have been, we meet at four o'clock and go till six, and I don't think we've provided any dinner yet. We probably That's need to do that. Yes. But they have really, <laughs> at the end of a long work day, they've, they've really um, shown a high level yeah. of commitment, engagement, and I think over time, um, as Ms. Moore said, um, their, their voices have been heard. So. The next steps, uh, one of them uh, you have listed here, are the you know final exams. So when do you think you'll get to that? There were some. So again, the 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 specifics around final exams mm -hmm. are not specifically in the charge of this work group. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, as we it's on your list. <clears throat> Next steps. I thought it's on it So I guess I the point, somewhere. Yeah. So I don't. I want to be clear that this work group of 40 people is not tackling final exams mm -hmm. specifically. Mm -hmm. Right now, the, the grade book templates, the 50% rule, the semester grade calculation, mm -hmm. reassessment. Um, that's the scope of this group of people who have made the commitment to be a part of. The so are you going to have another group that'll look at final we're exams? Have lots I think of, I read that memo. Yeah, we're going to have. But that. I guess the. What, what we need to do is engage lots of people in other forums. So, mm -hmm. for example, we talk regularly um, with parents about this topic. We talk regularly with MCA leadership about this topic. And I think the forums for us to talk about curriculum, assessment, how we approach mandated assessment throughout the district is a, a bigger one um, outside the scope of what this particular group of 40 people have been charged with. Hmm. So what's the reluctance to ask the teachers, you know, about final exams. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm on this kick. So I can answer that. Okay. I've discussed it, and I think we're going to discuss it tomorrow. Okay. Chris and I are talking yeah. tonight. I've discussed it uh, with the MCA Board of Directors on okay. multiple occasions, and we're continuing to discuss it. As things evolve, mm -hmm. I think we're going to have to continue to look at how we use examinations and assessments um, as an organization uh, in the best interests of students. So where we are now is not where I particularly would have chosen to be, mm -hmm. but I wasn't here in the year before I came when they made the decisions they made. I would have given a, a somewhat different recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the recommendation that was made and the board's intent at that time given what they knew and understood and what we all knew and understood uh, was what they thought was in the best interest of students at that time. So I, uh, the other piece of this that's critically important is when you look at the elementary and middle school curriculum adoption, there's a real shift there in the way that the new curricula uses assessment. And certainly that's going to have to come at the high school level, you know, in the near future, as we talk about curriculum updates there at the high school level. So there's no way to divorce final exams or any sorts of assessments when you talk about uh, a, a shift in curriculum because they're an integral part of the instructional cycle. I mean, knowing what a student knows and then responding to that and what they don't know and responding to that is at the essence of my job as a teacher, knowing what they know. And it's important to know at the end, that's a performance part of it, but it's also important to know the first week, the second week, the third day, the fifth day, the next second month, mm -hmm. and that's what we have to figure out and keep working on. And so as we change the curricula, we'll continue to change assessments. Uh, 
Nikki Hazel is going through that right now, this year, with her initial schools in the elementary and middle school rollout and making sense of it. And we were at the board of directors of the MCPTA last night till uh, 6.45 talking about these things uh, with them. And so it's, as Scott said, it's a broad topic with huge levels of interest across teachers, administrators, and uh, community members and families and, and students. We ought to be talking to students about right. what's the most right. effective for them too. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, I think you know that the teachers want the, high school teachers want the final exams back. And, um, you know, so, and, you know, this was a topic, I guess, when we ran for the board in 2016. And, um, you know, so we're three years in with all of this and it just seems to be moving it <clears throat> what Dr. King called in his letter from Birmingham City Jail, horse and buggy pace. And, um, you know, just in terms of the um, students, uh, what we hear from them uh, as they go on to college and, you know, that, you know, are they really being prepared? Because that's what they do. They take, you know, final exams and things like that. And that's what they get the grades based on, um, you know. So I, I have real concerns about that. Um, you know, and I, I, you know, definitely think it's something that, uh, you know, um, we should should work on. I, I'm I'm not clear, you know, whether we are or, you know, what does MCEA say about it or, I, I don't know. Do you know? Well, <clears throat> I think. You know, we hear the same thing from our from our teachers, from st from students, from parents about this question of mm -hmm. what's the best way to assess student learning, um, and I think there remain different points of view on it. I just didn't want to create, um, I didn't want to overpromise or 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 have any false impressions that this work group was yeah. specifically working on that topic. Mm -hmm. um, believe it or not, the, the fundamental shift that's happening with these gradebook templates to be more consistent mm -hmm. across our schools right. in the same course is, is, is a pretty sizable shift and has taken some time to get there. Mm. Uh, well, I'm just, you know, thinking the last time we had this conversation, uh, you know, at the table, which may have been a year ago, I don't know. Um, I was under the impression that that was something that, you know, uh, we would take up. And, um, you know, I still feel that it's something that, you know, we should definitely take up. And um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, Scott. I won't press you too much more, but, um, you know, uh, I'll have to do some more work on this. Okay, thanks. Mrs. Mondrowski. I'll be quick. I just want to say thank you very much for the presentation. I appreciate it. I look forward to seeing the work that this work group um, is able to do and get done. Um, just for clarification, teachers still can give final exams if they want to. Is that correct? It is an option. Of, yeah. They just have a selection of, of things now, right? Of, of, of assessment well, opportunities would, yeah, instead. The, the, there's no district-wide assessment. Your light's not on, so we yeah. can't hear you if you're talking. No, I was just going to say there's no district-wide assessment anymore. I mean, right. final right. exams were given before the district-wide test, the test that MCPS made up, because uh, I remember giving tests, uh, you know, final exams according to that same schedule. Um, you know, I, uh, well. Thank so. you, Ms. Dixon. Yeah. I just yes. wanted to clarify that they still could give final exams if they yeah. wanted to. On the yes. Road. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Wolf. I too want to thank you for your work on this. Um, as you know, in the briefing, I said I'm a pr proponent of final exams also. But what I will ask is whether or not when you finish your work around this, will you be going out to the broader, you know, teacher community to get input or are you going to only rely on those 40 people that are in the group? because I'm hoping you'll get some feedback on what your final templates look like so that you can get buy-in from the people when it, when it does go out. That's my first thought. And my second one is, um, um, wait a minute now, I'm having a moment. 
It's okay. Well, you talk about that while I think of what it is I was going to say. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I know. We've done a little of that work already. We've had um, the teachers who are active participants that are on our group, they have gone back to their constituents and surveyed RTs of uh, math, for example, and asked them about feedback or what their thoughts were around particular templates. So we have done that work, mm -hmm. and that data is some of the data we are using as a work group to determine which template would be the best fit per mm -hmm. content. Okay, so let me just ask you this for my own understanding. So if I'm a, a teacher that gives a final exam, what, what will it be lumped under test or whatever you're coming up with? I'd have to put it in one of those categories. Mm -hmm. So if, if I give a final exam <coughs> and you don't give a final exam, how does that work? Well, the teachers, as they collaborate, but um, we talked about earlier, the consistency that we've focused on right now is consistency within course teams. Mm -hmm. So that we can feel uh, relatively confident that teachers within course teams have those conversations about the major assessments that they're giving. So if a course team decided, if the AP US history team decided they wanted to give a final exam, they wanted to give a culminating exam, I guess we might call it, right, to assess student learning over the course of the semester, they might decide they're gonna break it up over two class periods because of the length of the exam we're going to give the common exam it's going to be this weight we're going to put it in the summative category this is the amount of points those are the regular conversations that our teacher teams would have um, it would not be ideal for one teacher to give that mm -hmm. exam and another teacher not to we've really focused thus far on creating that consistency within teams and as as um, the team shared now it's taking that sort of <coughs> a little more broadly in terms of the templates and that conversation about assessment is one that, you know, is important that to talk to the point that um, Mr. Murphy made about teacher autonomy, that we also have to leave space for teachers to make decisions about the students in front of them. So what, how many assessments are needed um, based, based on the students they're teaching, what types of assessment work that, that they need. So I think there's, there's always that point about being um, <coughs> specific but also flexible. But does that help understand how that would look? I guess what I'm trying to figure out if, is if we're in the same, let's say we're in the same school, is that what makes up a team? Or yeah. is AP history a team across <coughs> the schools? AP, yeah, so AP, your content alike team, so the course team would be the team. So eighth grade US history, AP US history, the teachers who teach a common course would be your professional learning community or your course team. But do I meet with them? I mean, if you're yeah, in, in yeah, Kennedy right, and yeah, I'm in, Churchill, am I meeting oh, with you about what I'm right. doing? So we, so they meet with it. the school, the principals have processes for their course teams to meet, their professional learning communities or their course alike teams. They have time either designated in the schedule where they're all off the same period, or they might meet during their lunch time, or they might use after school meeting time. But there's some provisioning for when do the course teams meet, because they do have to come to those agreements around assessments, templates, mm -hmm. looking at data, those kinds of professional learning activity professional learning community activities. Um, now, teachers across schools, there's lots of opportunities that Mr. Murphy can talk about that the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs creates for teachers to share information across schools in terms of best practices. I guess what I'm trying to really figure out is if, if I'm teaching AP history and I give five assessments and you're teaching AP history and you give eight assessments, how is that, how is that equitable across schools? So that's where we discussed the conversation has been around allowing for some some autonomy and some ability to respond to the students in front of you. So I may give an assessment and my students did not perform as well as your students. Mm -hmm. So I decide I need to reteach and I need to reassess. I may replace that grade. I may decide that it needs to be done in a different way. So I may add an assessment um, for my students. We want teachers to still have that flexibility. However, there's a range, and that's part of the conversation that's been happening in the work group, is what's an acceptable range? Uh, that's some, this, the question you're asking is, is some of the things that we're grappling with. Okay, I, I, I hear you, and I'm, I'm still a little uncomfortable with it, but I'll yeah. wait and see. I would like to see final exams reconsidered because I do believe that it prepares students better for being able to perform in college because they have to know how to synthesize information. Okay. Mrs. O'Neill. 
Well, building on the conversation about final exams, you know, um, you know, I w I've been here since the beginning of the district-wide final exams, and the idea was <laughs> that we needed to have consistency among schools, I mean, across schools, and we needed to have consistency within a building. And when we first administered the district-wide assessment in algebra, lo and behold, we discovered that you know, a kid at Wheaton could have a 70 and get an A, and a kid at Whitman, it was an, you know, 90 was the cutoff, that we didn't have consistency across schools or across buildings. And so we embarked on grading and reporting policy changes. And I have to say, you know, in 2006, you know, I thought we had enough training that had gone on and the principals um, in the schools were sort of, you know, uh, train the trainer models in addition. And lo and behold, I went to back to school night at my daughter's middle school, and I had seven different interpretations of the grading policy because we didn't train enough, and so we had to delay. And furthermore, my daughter came home and said, Mommy, what have you done with her hand on her hip? But <laughs> You know, um, I, I think we have to distinguish. The, I do believe that having, you know, we, we had the required quarterly assessment so that that was supposed to be, you know, so we had consistency across the schools. The conversation about final exams, we had two weeks, in one in January, one in June, where nothing went on but final exams. But in the middle schools, exams were given in within the school day and not everything <coughs> stopped and so i i think what the high school teachers would really like is to have that week those weeks where you know they might have an exam on a given day and might not i mean i had a conversation with miss webster um, my daughter had the privilege of having her for ap us history and the conversation was you could still do a final exam you could do it split it up on two days within the school day and the conversation is that all the AP US history teachers in that school and that's what your answer was could be doing should be doing it as a school-wide issue I, I don't I think the more teaching less testing isn't is a barrier to having those two full weeks off for that's all we do is final exams. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a barrier. I, I, you know, I live in a family of attorneys. They, when they went to law school, you had one final exam. That was your whole grade. And but there is, I, I'm a person that, I think in sound bites. I learn in chunks. Spacing is important. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think the conversation about the value of being able to. Um, go back and review and and you know make sure that our kids really know the material is is important but it is going to have to be within the confines of the school day the other thing you know um, so I mean I, I feel like I'm in Groundhog Day where we constantly <laughs> are revisiting the issue of grant grading and consistency across schools it, you know, it's really, uh, you know, difficult. Um, I do think that we need to comment on the state proposed regulation on attendance. Mm -hmm. If we have not, we should be commenting because yes, it's going to have a significant impact. And then the other thing is spacing. I do believe it's mm -hmm. that we need to have spacing. And I constantly hear from students and from parents, and I experienced it as a parent, that it seems like you get to the end of the marking period and bam, there is a whole load of work that we teachers within a building mm -hmm. should be, you know, planning better that we don't have appropriate spacing and that it is a burden on our students to have everything pile in at the end of the marking period. So I, you know, I don't know how we get that message across, but Nate's shaking his head, but I know I, th I thought, oh, how, how can this be? 
in English and math there's you know English has a major essay due math has a major a summative assessment AP US history has this AP physics has a toothpick bridge that's due all within the space of a couple of days and it's not reasonable for our students and we hear it from parents Daka. okay I certainly agree about spacing I, I didn't know that that's what you called it but yeah a lot of assignments are based on that one thing at the end of the nine weeks which is really inherently not fair to students and final exams I've been here longer than Mrs. O'Neill and final final exams were two hour exams when they started but we did not we did not close the school down for the people who were taking the final exams we had to place the other ones in different rooms or in different activities while the final exams were going on so that's when we moved to the two hour final exams two a day for instance English and history on the same day and then all the other students who had other tests didn't come at that time so there's a, a lot of operational ideas and, and information that you have to do in order to do the final exams and we know that you can do them in two chunks one hour each I don't know whether that's the answer or not I don't know what we're going to do about the final exams um, I do think they're important um, and I do think we need to help students to be ready for the final kind of assessment and when we talked about quarterlies it was a uh, very hopeful talk I think because we said oh they're going to have different ways of assessing students they'll do projects they'll do uh, performances they'll do well it they'll have a portfolio it takes so much time to do that that I think people have moved away from that as well I mean it's just if you've got a class of 22 kids and they each have to give a report or they each have to do a performance it takes up a lot of time you can't just do that in two days it's, it takes almost a week to get to everybody and uh, when we were talking about those students in that gray area um, that the final exams were not really helping them so much I think that and you brought law school up somebody did you did and you did still new. they have study groups in law school now I'm not saying that we should require that but that might be something that we might talk with students about mm -hmm. um, in order to uh, or teachers to help them help okay. students to catch up on things like that I have another operational question about credit recovery um, if a student is in say algebra one and fails the first semester does the school have to provide a class of some other kind for that student um, since unless they have credit recovery which means they have to be able to pr provide that staff too if I think I understand your question so if if a student doesn't pass algebra 1a do they go on to algebra 1b yes they go on to algebra 1b and then they they will start the credit recovery process usually simultaneous that's our best practice is that schools are monitoring each semester as students don't pass they want our ideal situation is to get the students into the credit recovery experience they're building it into um, the connections courses the resource classes that we have within the school day to try to make sure that students what we find is that really we need to capture them during the school day is the best way to have success um, the reality though is that many of our students who fail a course are failing a course for reasons that might be outside of their abilities so it might not be the right time for them to enter credit recovery so we're flexible in terms of when they may begin that work um, but schools their their ideal state is to get them in as soon as they can the next semester well I'm fascinated by that because teaching a language students can't go on to B if they haven't done a so uh, I'm having a problem with algebra I, I, I know I hear complaints from uh, some of the advanced <coughs> courses that we have or the teachers who are doing advanced courses and say that they don't know their algebra so I'm just having a problem with that I, I just uh, don't know how that can work Ms. Silvestri um, we touched on this a little bit uh, in terms of flexibility but um, I hear about retakes is that something that's uh, there's guidance in the new grade book can you talk about that and when when is it appropriate and how many retakes can you have yep so that's exactly what the work group's going to tackle next is 
what is what are those best practices for retakes or reassessments and how do we get to more consistency across our schools so to use the examples from earlier we could both be teaching algebra in two different schools and i might only allow one reassessment per marking period mm -hmm. she might allow reassessments on pretty much everything and and so what we're working on within the work group is exactly that what are the conditions with with which reteaching and reassessment is important so that we can help students learn and know that they're progressing and also apply it in a way that's more equitable across <coughs> schools so that's absolutely the next next phase of the group um and the things that you mentioned dr smith the retrieval retrieval practice spacing, spacing interweaving mm -hmm. are we working is that part of the work that we're doing i, I am interested in whatever it is that's <coughs> going to help students actually learn mm -hmm. the content well, how we do that is I came back last Sunday night late, and on Monday I had curriculum and instruction people in my office mm -hmm. talking about these things, and we're going to look at how our professional development needs to have strong instructional practice embedded in it every time. And I've been talking about this since I got here. We don't just do a professional learning around mathematics or social studies or science concepts. We do a professional learning around the content that also embeds the very best, most effective instructional practice, the cultural competence and understanding of students, the understanding of their well-being. We're talking about professionals here with advanced and multiple degrees. And yet, oftentimes, we break it down into these little chunks when we send people to professional learning or provide it online. We've got to show the complexity of it. You hear this conversation here. The conversation is what's happening is you guys are seeing the collision of the mechanisms of moving through school, mm -hmm. how we gauge performance, and whether or not it results in true, long-term, deep-level learning. That's why you get, Dr. Dog is right, some courses are absolutely sequential. If you don't learn this in Spanish mm -hmm. or in mathematics, you're not going to learn this. It's not going to happen. Others are recursive. You talked about social studies in English. They recurse back. But you reach points as, as a writer that if somebody doesn't help you make that next step, you just stay in that spin as a weak writer of language. And so we've got to embed these. So I've already begun to, I tried when I first came here, and it was just too early. There wasn't enough acceptance yet of it. But now I think we're ready to really begin to build professional learning that does all of these things that we're talking about in a much more complex, sophisticated way. And that's why we, if you talk about this for more than 15 minutes, you will run into yourself. That's what will happen. You will bump into yourself. So what happens is we create efficiency models. Efficiency models give everybody the same test in ninth grade English, in 12th grade social studies. And you know what that is? That is a disservice to learning and a disservice to human beings. And I don't mean we change the test for the kids. I mean, where do you want to go in your life, Jennifer Webster, in 11th grade? Are you headed to college? Are you headed to take some cybersecurity licensures? Right, what are you going to do, and how do I help you get there? We don't need to be preparing 7th graders or even 9th graders for college. We need to be preparing 9th graders for 10th grade and 10th graders for 11th grade. In 11th and 12th grade, for kids who are headed to a pure academic program at a university, and they say, that's what I wanna do, and I don't care if they say it, I don't care what their GPA is, I don't care what they've taken in the past, I had to help them get there. That's my job. Whether it's through MC and USG, whether it's through a year at MC and then going to College Park, that's my job, is to, you tell me what you want, Miss Moore, I'll tell you how to get there. But I don't need to do that when you're 14. I need to make sure you're learning at the level that you need so when you get to the 11th grade, you can do the work. We've got to remember that learning is central to this. It's not getting an A. It's not getting a 67%. It's learning is central to what we do. That's what we have to change. And we get hung up on the other mechanistic pieces or the performance level. I mean, that's what the problem with the state report card is. It shows all these stars all based on one test in one April. It's not enough information to know what's happening with a school, with a classroom, with a kid. It's not. So 
we're going to keep working. I'm not against final exams at all. I'm against rigid, inflexible, inappropriate use of assessment. That's what I'm opposed to. And I'm in, pro, I'm in favor of developmentally creating things that help kids get durable, long-lasting learning in their heads that if they walk out of here and their parents move them to Nebraska, they take it with them. Right. That's what I'm in favor of. And we can't do this carelessly or quickly. And we certainly should not go back to 2015. That, that's an indictment that is on that board. But it's not an indictment because people had ill intent or wanted to do something bad to kids. This has been one of the best school systems in this country for decades, it still is. How do we keep it moving forward for every kid? That's the question we ought to be asking as we do this work. And you know, Scott and Nikki know they're gonna be doing final exam conversation. They know that, it's part of, it is part of what it is, and we need it. But it is not the silver bullet of learning. It is not. So that's why we keep talking the way we do. We go, we run into ourselves with the discussion because it's three things that are all inextricably linked together that have different purposes and different ways of, of looking at a student. That's what it is. Jennifer might be the most learned seventh grader in the school and she might have the worst performance and I retained her. <coughs> but she might be the most <coughs> learned kid I'm serving in the entire seventh grade in this school. It's entirely possible. Or in this area, she's the most learned and she's the least learned in this area, which then I would introduce a whole nother topic about differences <coughs> in disciplinary understanding and conceptual understanding. So it's just, it's complicated, but we gotta do it and we gotta do it right. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, so that was my, point is let's focus the conversation yep. on what is actually going to help mm -hmm. students right. learn right. and retain right. the content yep. um my <coughs> last question is about the loss of credit and absenteeism uh this is a change from what we're currently doing and how will we let students know about the change the the <coughs> loss of credit as described by mrs hazel was our pre-2010 policy where the uh, students who had five unexcused absences, the teachers determined which students would lose credit. Mm -hmm. um, the, that was replaced in 2010 with the E3, which is um, failure based on attendance. But the key difference with E3, which has existed since 2010, what we've done most recently is really codify the practices that high schools developed over time that really work. Um, what the, I, the concept behind the E3 is that no student will lose credit for a course unless the school has done the intervention, that the adults have tried to, because the LC could have happened, I could have never called home or never had a conversation and boom, you got six, you get the LC versus she does not. Um, so the idea behind the attendance intervention in E3 is that schools identify students who um, have concerns around absenteeism they create the attendance intervention plans for for students and then if the students don't show improvement over time and i think it's important to note that we um we don't view these as a contract it's not a if you aren't perfect it's really about intervention and coaching and improvement um, then the students would lose credit so the conversations that uh, mr murphy and i've had with high school principals over the last two years i would say around this to really talk with them about what they're doing um, and what, as they're grappling with this as well, in terms of how we improve student attendance and what works, what the changes we made in the regulation were really minor in terms of just codifying that, that specific point about no student will receive an E3 unless they've had an attendance intervention plan. Mm -hmm. And the idea that um, if you had earned a passing grade, that students should have the opportunity to have that um, restored. But is there anything that we need to be communicating to families or students about the change? <clears throat> The, we talked, the, um, uh, we're working with the student groups in terms of uh, Ms. Cherry and uh, we, we've had these conversations with our student leaders and with principals and engaging. They've had to really think about how they engage their communities around this conversation because as they've had to say, 
Um, this can happen that if you don't attend class, you can receive an E3. Our principals have had to communicate that directly to their communities, to parents and to students. Um, I've seen a variety of different messages and ways principals have communicated that to students um, using, tying this really in with the work um, that's being done with um, family services around attendance awareness and chronic absenteeism, really uh, um, tying this to that awareness around the importance of going to school. Um, but the E3 does represent the opportunity to communicate to students and to parents there is potentially a consequence for not attending mm -hmm. school. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Tinby. So I associate myself with my colleagues' comments. Um, I wanted to know in the school by school grading systems, who are uh, the staff members in a school building that traditionally um, choose how the grading system in that school will be? So current state is before the school year starts, the team of teachers of the light course within the school building uh, will create, will decide on the grading template for that particular course. Um, that's current policy, it's also current practice. Now some schools will take that course alike team and say, you know what, the US history course doesn't need to be different from the government course. All of social studies is gonna be the same within that building. And then after they make those decisions as a team, they program it into the computer system, and that becomes the grade book template for the entire school year. Okay. All right. Thanks for the presentation. Appreciate it. Dr. Daka? Yeah, I wrote myself a question about E3, and the way it was described is what we used to do. And I'm only going to speak about Montgomery Blair because I had to be in charge of it, and we had to meet with the student. We had to give them some <laughs> guidance as to how to come to class. We had to let the parents know. We had to be involved with counselors. I don't, you mean that wasn't happening everywhere? That's why the state's gone to E3 and described it that way? I mean, I, I just can't believe that it wasn't happening. I don't think the state, I don't think it was that it wasn't happening. I think what there's in, there was inconsistency between schools without us being really specific about the fact that you needed to use the form which does require you to have documentation of involving the counselor, people, personnel, worker, what steps is the school taking? So in the absence of specificity around that and a specific form to document it, uh, there was there, there's an opportunity for inconsistency where some schools may have given E3s without having really done that intervention. Ms. Dixon. Yep, so I just want to go back and I want to be on record uh, as well, uh, saying that I do favor the return to final exams. I think that the final exams were done away with, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know whether Josh Starr was here or whether we had, you know, an interim superintendent who was not an educator, um, that this all occurred during that time. Um, students have done, you know, some of the things that my colleagues have talked about. They've had study, they have study groups. Uh, yes, there were two exams given, then students went home and studied for, you know, other exams that they had. The teachers were involved in grading those exams uh, as well, and you could benchmark across the system to know how students at Paint Branch were doing on exams compared to, let's say, you know, students at Whitman or Wheaton, however you wanted to do that uh, as well. And this idea that the teachers weren't doing anything or they had two weeks off is just bogus. It's just not true because they planned they were involved in their professional learning communities as well during that time, you know. So people, you know, were upset they might have had time, you know, once, twice a year to go out to have lunch, you know, and come back. Why would we deny them that opportunity, you know, as well? So I want to know, you know, when I'm sick, what did you learn in biology? You know, I don't want you operating on me, you know, uh, as a doctor, you don't know these things. Uh, it, it's, uh, I think, you know, I agree with what you say, Dr. Smith, about, um, you know, how we want kids to absorb and learn, but um, I, I don't think that anyone will ever be able to replace a teacher and, at least at the high school level that I know of, that's steeped in their content and can communicate that, teach that to students, um, allow students to grow, 
and um, uh, you know, then then move on. I, I think you know, uh, college education is still the standard, the gold standard uh, for most folks uh, and most families in this country. And and I know it it still is, uh, you know, for um, you know students of color as well. And so oftentimes they don't know what they want to do. You know, they they learn different things and. Um, you know, they go to college sometimes thinking they're going to do this and then they do something else. So I just think that it's really important to have some standards and um, that exams uh, give you that. And, um, you know, and I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, well, yeah, we did this. You know, it was a mistake, like we did with Curriculum 2.0 after five years. You know, we got rid of it and, you know, we bought a new curriculum. And um, anyway, it's... Uh, so we have you on yeah, record. I'm done. Yes, you Right, do. and um, Mr. Murphy and Mrs. Hazel have... Um, Ms. Hazel mentioned, or Dr. Smith um, said to them that... Um, we can take this up at some point. Right. This work yeah. group does not have we'll to break up. Visit you guys, right? Um, so we can discuss that. Yeah, absolutely. The right. work group is not. The work group will keep doing the work it's doing. Mm -hmm. As part of the curriculum evolution process, we have to have the conversation about assessment, which includes final exams, right. which includes final exams for the appropriate developmental level of chill of the students we're serving and okay. the purpose of the exam in their learning progression. That's what we have to talk about. Right. As, and so I'm not saying we shouldn't look at it. I'm right. not particularly pleased with what we're doing right now. If I had been here in 2016 or 15, whenever it was, I would have recommended to the board that we build a much more complex system of exams and assessments that make sense for the discipline, the, the student's age and grade level, for the purpose of the learning and where they're headed because I'll tell you the people who are offering most of the jobs in this state right now don't care if you passed AP English they care if you got a certification in system networking or cybersecurity and that doesn't mean that what I did in English is not important and valuable it just means it's not the only thing that's important and valuable that's how we have to think about it so we will continue to work on this through the curriculum process and next time we come back to you, we'll be talking about how it's evolving and we'll continue to work with the work group yep. on the foundational parts that give final exams more meaning. So you don't end up with the statistics that you looked at on that board mm -hmm. with very disparate results for kids. That just shouldn't happen. That you should not be able to predict based on someone's race or culture or income level. That just shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so that's what our goal is, to use the tools for their fundamental purpose. So we will keep working on this. Okay. Well, thank you all for your presentation today and the work that you've thank done you. and will continue to do. And at this time, we will continue on, um, on our agenda. The next item, item 12, is just for information purposes only. If we move to item 13, appointment to board committee to board committees, if I can get a motion to approve the board committee's uh, appointments and block. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? And that is unanimous. The next item, item 14, Board of Education items, if I can get a motion to move items 14.1 and 14.2 in block. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? And that is unanimous. So as we move to item 14.3, we will hear from Mr. Tenbite on the dates for the process for um, the student, the 43rd student member of the Board of Education election. Sure, so it's that time of the year. I can't say it's that time of the year again because I haven't it's been this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, so basically the, the overlaying um, events happening for the 42nd, 43rd student member of the Board of Education election um, starts on January 2nd, which is coming up in uh, less than a little less than a month. Um, the advertising period as well as the filing period is from January 2nd to January 24th, 2020. The nominating convention um, is on February 12th, 2020. The general election campaign period 
is either after that first nominating convention up until April 22nd or after the snow date for the nominating convention, which is on February 19th, um, up until February 22nd. The election day for the uh, election is on um, early, the early election day um, for the election is on April 17, 2020, and the general election will be on April 22, 2020. Whereas the Montgomery County region of the Maryland Association of Student Councils submits a yearly calendar of the major events surrounding the election of the student member of the Board of Education for review and approval. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education approve the calendar of major events for the election of the 43rd student member of the Board of Education as proposed by the Montgomery County region of the Maryland Association of Student Councils. Okay. If I can get a motion to approve the calendar events that Mr. Tinbite just read. He second? Oh, can I get a second? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry here. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? And that is unanimous. We're at 14.4. Um, we will hear from Mr. Tinbite if you can discuss the sure. item on the table that from last meeting. Yeah, this is a resolution that I'm bringing up on behalf of all of us um, to the table. This is something that I definitely heard from students as a primary concern last year and this year throughout the um, throughout my election as I went to all of the 66 secondary mm -hmm. schools and I talked to thousands of kids. Um, basically, a lot of students expressed frustration, but also hopes in terms of expanding driver's education in Montgomery County, uh, especially because to take driver's education mm -hmm. as uh, a course or to get your license, you do need driver's education, and that costs hundreds of dollars in um, Montgomery County and in the real world, there's no financial aid, right? So um, this is something that I hope to push for. Montgomery County in the past did provide driver's education uh, in their school system, but um, it's not offered anymore. So I hope that we can start to take the steps towards this and to start with this memorandum. The background, Maryland Code 16105 requires that individuals under 18 years of age successfully complete a state approved driver's education program before receiving a professional driver's license. Students and families spend several hundred dollars in order to meet the state driver's education program requirement. A 2013 study conducted by the AAA Foundation for traffic safety found racial and economic disparities in teens who are able to obtain their driver's license by age 18. Whereas costs, convenience, and competing academic priorities often act as barriers to teens who might otherwise become licensed drivers, and whereas students are increasingly overwhelmed with academic and extracurricular activities, and offering driver's education at school sites would offer a convenient option for students, and whereas earning a driver's license would lead to increased opportunities for students such as part-time employment and increased access to goods, services, and experiences, whereas local driver's education programs are currently offered at full price at various Montgomery County Public High Schools after school and on weekends. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education directs the superintendent of schools to explore partnership opportunities partnership options with local, public, and private driver's education programs that would increase the availability and reduce the cost of state-required driver's education programs, specifically in communities impacted by poverty, and provide a report of the findings to the Board of Education no later than March 2020. Okay. So we got a motion on the table. Can I get a second? Second. Okay. We moved and seconded. I don't know if people want to discuss it. Um, I'll just say as a parent, who has a permit holder in our home. We paid $350 um, this past summer. And so That's anything that we could do to partner um, to reduce the cost for some of our families who cannot yeah. um, pay that amount would be great. So lot. I support it. And um, I don't see any other lights. So it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Um, at this time, we will hear from... Dr. Daka, if you can address your item. For um, diverse religious observ observances. Me? Okay. 
whereas the Board of Education strives to foster a diverse and welcoming uh, learning environment for all students in Montgomery County Public Schools, whereas the Board of Education has adopted respect as a core value and recognizes that diversity of culture, interests, skills, and backgrounds is an asset that makes the school district stronger, whereas the Montgomery County Public Schools student body and workforce is composed and comprised of individuals of various faiths, and whereas the students of Montgomery County Public Schools uh, observe a panoply of religious holidays, and this rich diversity enhances our students' educational experience. And whereas the Board of Education is committed to ensuring that students have equitable access to educational opportunities regardless of their religious background, and whereas the commitment to a culture of respect and equity that embraces the religious diversity of our community is reflected in Board of Education Policy ACA, non-discrimination, equity, and cultural proficiency. Other board policies as well as Montgomery County Public Schools regulations and the guidelines for respecting religious diversity of MCPS, which is published annually to provide guidance to staff to, uh, to in making feasible and reasonable accommodations for our students' religious beliefs and practices. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education celebrate the diversity of faith within our community. The Board of Education supports religious holiday accommodations, excused absences for students, observance of religious holidays, and flexibility in assignments where <coughs> reasonable and practical so that students are not inappropriately penal, penalized for choosing to observe religious holidays. The Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools will ensure that respect for and tolerance of diverse religious backgrounds is emphasized in all Montgomery County Public Schools and that students who observe religious holidays are duly supported and accommodated. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Okay, so our next item is 14.5, new business items. Are there any board members that are bringing forward new business items? Mrs. I am. Madraska. Thank you. I um, think all of you should have a copy of the water bottle filling stations um, suggestion that I make. I don't know if you need me to speak on it now or just put it forward and let it and say it's going to sit on the table and we talk about it after or which would. What's so let's put it on the table and then. Or, or is it, does anybody go ahead and speak to it? Go ahead. Well, I just, um, I mean, I can kind of read through, but um, you all can read it as well. Uh, generally, the gist of it is, is that, you know, um, about two years ago, I think it was, we passed a resolution um, requesting fiscal a supplement appropriation and amendment to the fiscal year 2019-2024 capital improvements budget for the amount of $2 million. Um, so that MCPKS could put, uh, purchase and install an average of two water bottle, bottle filling stations in all Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, the resolution was adopted by the board and transmitted to the county executive and the Montgomery County Council. Um, so working with uh, facilities uh, management, we kind of reevaluated some of the cost and um, looked at it looked as though to put two water bottle filling stations in all of our schools um, they determined it would be about 1.2 million um, so in an effort to bring the cost down to you know as, as low as we could um, I'm proposing that we ask for a supplemental appropriation and amendment to the budget um, to allow for um, I think we said two hundred thousand dollars. Sorry, gotta find that where it is. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Two hundred thousand dollars, um, which should cover. Um, it's you know it's not everything that would be wonderful, but it's um, it would cover at least one water bottle filling station near the cafeteria um, at each of our secondary schools that don't currently have any. Um, we know that our water fountains and everything and our water sources inside our school are fine. Um, this is not, as Dr. Zuckerman mentioned when we talked about it at the work session, not so much specifically about need, but it is about being environmentally um, friendly. What is it? <laughs> yes, friendly. Um, as well as, you know, hoping that we will eventually save up enough money that it would pay for itself um, through money saved by purchasing some of the water individual water bottles um, so that both 
would help cover the cost as well as um, be environmentally uh, better environmentally. Um, and it's really about equity. I mean, we know that a lot of our schools aren't capable of raising uh, outside funds, whether it be through PTAs or um, whatever. And so just making sure that, you know, we're doing what we can to make sure everyone has equal access. And, um, and so that's where this is coming from. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Can we get a list of what high schools and middle schools yes, we have currently that. have them? Mm -hmm. And I thought it wasn't necessarily by the cafeteria, it was by the gym that they generally put them. And we're putting them in as we go in to do work, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. I mean, that's we're putting what, them in as we, yeah, as we're doing, all we're doing schools, other projects. Construction has them. Yeah, or as, getting you know, as we're doing a project in a school. But, but I correct. would like to see the list. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that, uh, and it's not oh about, God. we had an email from someone saying, well, you know, you have to support safe drinking water. We are having exactly. safe drinking That's not water. This is, about. this is about being environmentally yeah. Correct. Um, yeah. sensitive Correct. and friendly. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, are we generally putting them in, in or the, Dr. by Zuckerman the come and speak I to mean, by the gyms or the cafeteria? <laughs> he's like, and he's like, no. <laughs> Could you speak? <laughs> Dr. Zuckerman, we also put a whereas clause in the CIP resolution that we just had on the yeah, 26th. Could you speak We've to been that? having conversations about this being for the cafeteria, um, oh. this specific uh, aspect that Ms. Madraski is talking about, mm -hmm. okay. um, and that is going in a new construction. And you are right, in the, in the resolution, um, our language reflected, we will accelerate to the um, extent possible. Uh, so this would be above and beyond that. And we have a list. Uh, we do. do. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just will send it tomorrow. Yes. Oh. Cool. So everyone can see it. Okay. Yep. Okay. Did you move it? So um, I did. It. Well, I'm I'm asking to move it. Yes. So I thought we're, oh, we're going to lay on, have a lay on the oh, table. I was going to say, but I thought just it's on the table. Can I just yep. ask a question? Sure. <clears throat> when you say in the CIP, to the extent possible. How do, what's the interplay of that with this two hundred thousand dollars supplemental request? It's my answer off a light um, for a second, so we can turn on a light. So, uh, with anything, as as it's all going to uh, have to be done within spending affordability guidelines. So, um, if there was a supplemental approved by the council for two hundred thousand, at some point there will be a trade-off. Down the road, um, we're fully anticipating a list of uh, us having to put forward a list of non-recommended reductions, which is what happened. Well, actually, this didn't get even funded by the county executive a couple of years ago. But um, so something else will not get done, and that's always the deal with the budget, whether it's operating or capital, as the board well knows. So um, th there will be a trade-off here. Would be my best guess. Thank you. That's what I was trying to figure out. Thanks. Ms. Dixon, I saw your light on. Yeah, thank wow. you. Um, I think it's a great idea, you know, to try to do it again and put it by the cafeteria because when the water is there, you're more likely to drink it. And, you know, I, I, I'm always amazed that sometimes people can eat without drinking Drink. something <laughs> behind it. But, you know, you're supposed to drink water or some liquid to carry the food. You know, I think that's in biology, you know, out. So uh, I think, you know, it would be a good idea to put it where kids are and where they're eating and things like that. Yeah. Dr. Daka. Yeah. Uh, did I hear something about defraying expenses for this by purchasing water mm -hmm. bottles? By purchasing. Potentially being able to purchase fewer of the individual water bottles that we put out in the cafe at lunch times now. Oh, we would not be. We would they have wouldn't to be going fewer. to the soda machines and get no 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 no, no, no. Right. we are currently purchasing it's yeah so okay 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 got it question. so um question oh Miss Vestry I'm sorry I didn't see your light um are there currently water fountains in the cafeteria yes there are so this is more just a convenience. Yeah, I mean, as Ms. Madrowski said, this is th this is about um, essentially environmental stewardship. Uh, students um, don't usually fill their water bottles up from the water fountain. They're, they'll go to where there is a place that has a 
a filler, but you could conceivably fill your water bottle up from a, a water fountain. And if a water fountain, what we are currently doing, when practical, if a water fountain um, breaks, uh, and it's it's e if we have to replace the water fountain, if it's easy to do so, we're going to install a new water fountain that has one with a water mm -hmm. filling. It, it, some of it just depends on the plumbing, the mm -hmm. location, the ability to do it at a reasonable cost. And then, as we discuss all new construction, we're putting um, specifications in to do this. Um, it's it is absolutely it's a <laughs> it is a nice thing to have. Um, it is it's not a necessity, but it's it is a nice thing to have. Right. So also, we look at the list of schools, right? That yes, have it. Okay. Like, great. Also, to uh, to be truthful, as a student in a school, the water bottle filling station water does taste a little better. <laughs> to be honest, we don't doubt it. Okay. Turn your light on. Turn your light on. Turn your light on. We can't hear you. The water uh, fountains are quick. You just go there very quickly and take the a little drink. Stations. The oh. No, the oh, filling oh, stations, yeah, you can fill a bottle and you can yeah. take it with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right, yeah. But right. before water bottles. And you don't know stations, what happens in those water fountains <laughs> either. <laughs> the, same, the same water bottle goes right up to the water bottle filling station as it does. You tilt it this way. Okay. Uh, and before the advent of water bottle filling stations, I spent many days pushing the button and tilting and just getting it just right. I couldn't get it all the way to the top, but I got it pretty close. So, so it'll lie on the table. And as Miss as Miss O'Neill said, I'm I'm very very pleased and I'm glad that that, that the board mentioned it that um, this is not at this point a water safety issue at all because of Montgomery County's ordinance as well as the state's uh, law around this. So. Okay. So can I get a second to have this item lie on the table? Okay. Okay. So it's been moved and seconded and it will lie on the table. Um, so I hope when we transmit it, if it passes that we to the council and the county executive you know they had written to us when the uh, climate emergency students had you know come and marched and have written to us and testified that we're do this is a step you know so I mean I two hundred thousand dollars in the whole capital budget is pretty small except when it competes with PLR other you know for other things but I think it's a worthy it's the right thing to do, but I, you know, I, I think that maybe, you know, when we look at the list, um, we may want to increase it possibly. If, mm -hmm. well, like I said, I would have thought, I would have asked for more, but I figured this is a start, and I know that um, I have heard that, you know, the county council and and whatnot are supportive of this idea so hopefully well I guess we'll find out <laughs> if it okay. passes so all right okay so then at this time we are moving on to the next item which is um, item 15 informational summaries just for informational purposes only if I can get a motion in a second to adjourn that'd be great second. okay the mood is seconded all those in favor and that is unanimous we are adjourned <laughs>